So I'm pretty sure everybody here knows who Dan Schneider is. And if you don't know who he is, he is honestly very questionable at the best. I mean, I guess very creative at the least. But uh, today I'm here to react to Quentin Review's video on We Don't Talk About Dan Schneider, I believe the title is. Uh, you guys can find the original video in the description. Uh, but this is his video. This was his very interesting thumbnail because Dan Schneider, for anyone that doesn't know, was a Nickelodeon producer who created a lot of the shows that I personally and a lot of people probably watch this video and in my chat right now enjoyed as kids. It, it, he was just a guy that basically um, wrote, produced, directed like shows like iCarly, um, I believe all that, The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, and, you know, a, a whole list of other shows. But, you know, there was a documentary that came out recently on HBO Max called Quiet on Set that went ahead and focused around the people that worked with him and saw the weird things that allowed on set due to either his involvement or just him blatantly ignoring and allowing said things to happen. And um, I think Quentin has been talking about that stuff for a while now in his videos because he had an entire series of videos on his channel discussing essentially everything that happened in these old Nickelodeon shows and how certain parts of them were very weird because of specifically Dan Schneider's involvement. And now Quentin is ending his series uh, where he basically spent about like, you know, four years of his life, which equates to maybe about 40 hours worth of videos. I'm not even kidding on that. On everything starting from iCarly um, to Victorious uh, to Sam and Cat that Dan Schneider worked on while at Nickelodeon. So let's begin. Let's react to this. It's very ominous, right? Like the slow crawl in on Dan right now, uh, but also very creative. Well, that is just a... Absolutely On September the 17th, 1986, okay. the teen sitcom Head of the Class first premiered on ABC. The series was a twist on older legacy sitcoms of the decade before, specifically Welcome Back, Cotter. This absolutely completely subverted my expectations of where it was going. Like this genuinely just like went from being like this very sad thing to just being this very happy thing in like a minute. Did not expect expect that did not expect that at all i'm sure he's gonna bring it back around though which had featured a soft-hearted teacher taking over a class of slow-witted delinquents while finding promise in each of them is and that teaching john them travolta wait a second john travolta was at a tv show oh my goodness dude all i know john travolta from is greece to find personal ambition Head of the class sought to be the subversive polar opposite of this cliche. In the series, substitute teacher Charlie Moore finds himself permanently taking over a study period at Millard Fillmore High, a class which openly exists solely so the smartest kids at school can study for their academic team. However, Mr. Moore finds the group to be pompous, asocial, and lacking in any real teen experiences. They don't go on dates, don't do school events, and basically they're all so dedicated to academics that they have no lives. What's wrong with that? Genuinely speaking, what's wrong with being a kid that absolutely just enjoys going to school, right? Like, dude, the 80s were different, bro. They really thought that kids should have been cooler than this. They were like, yo, you're a kid that actually just enjoys school? Ha, huh, what a nerd. You're such a loser, okay? Go outside and touch grass. That's crazy, which is like the opposite of what they tell kids to do these days. These days are like, whoa, 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 kids, all right, stop touching grass, go home and study, insane. He suggests that they have a lot of developing to do, especially when it comes to Janice Lazaretto, a 10 year old who skipped several grades and is considered the smartest student in the class. Would you like to see it now? In a minute. But you're cutting into our time, Mr. Moore. Janice, you're only 10 years old. Time is all you've got. Mr. Moore encourages them to point. commit to living normal teenage lives while he attempts to teach them anyways. He shows them that an ability to memorize and recite facts does not match his actual real world experience, as he was actually present at many of the historical events he discusses in the classroom. I'm gonna read these over the weekend and Monday we start with the Chicago demonstrations. Aren't they referred to as the Chicago riots? What we were demonstrating. Uh, yikes, dude. 
Ooh, oh man all right these guys 80s were different guys okay we can't be too mad at them all right they were just there it was a different time okay it was a different time Large number of people in uniform were rioting <laughs> mr moore has a tendency to begin his lessons on tangents which seem totally meaningless at first before eventually revealing them to be an essential part of understanding a lesson or piece of the wider story his talents as a speaker are proven time and time again by his ability to get a class of know-it-alls who think they have nothing left to learn to listen endlessly to his long stories. But Moore is not without his limitations. Okay. He had previously moved to the coast after high school in order to pursue a profession in the theater, but his hopes and ambitions had been crushed. Throughout the series, he has to occasionally juggle his insistence that the kids can do whatever they seek to achieve with his own failure to live out that promise. In several memorable episodes, he also helps the students put on famous plays, That's essentially acting as if he were the school's theater teacher. Head of the Class ran for five long seasons, despite being set in a high school five? and supposedly starring upperclassmen. By the end of the show, most of the cast were between 25 to 30, and all were still role-playing as if they were 17-year-olds. That is impressive, though. Holy crap, dude. 30-year-olds pretending to be, like, 17-year-olds, but also a fucking high school show that went on for five seasons. Genuinely impressive. That is a, that is a good show. And as I'm sure you can imagine, with a cast of 11 leads who were not consistent for the entire run of the show, it wasn't uncommon for the writers to shuffle. Okay, yeah, she definitely looks 30, bro. I don't know what to tell you. This man looks like he's 40. He's definitely pushing. There's no way these guys are teenagers. I look at these people, and they definitely look a lot older. You're not fooling anyone. You're literally not fooling anyone. You know You know what fooled people? Degrassi. Although, to be fair, I think most of the people in Degrassi might have been teenagers at the time that that show was a thing. But like not not here. This is these are adults. Shuffle the deck in terms of who was being matched with whom for either romantic subplots or comedic banter. But very quickly, two characters became paired up with extreme cons. This man is someone's dad. He is not 16 and in high school. Consistency. Arvid Engen and Dennis Blunden. Arvid is a mathematician, a bookworm, and someone who's in love with a popular girl at school and does not hide it. I'm, I'm smart and funny looking. It's a deadly combination. <laughs> Albert Einstein, smart and funny looking, right? Marilyn Monroe said that he was the sexiest man she ever met. Unfortunately, Marilyn Monroe is no longer in the dating pool. <laughs> While Dennis is a cynical yet excitable prankster, obsessed with technology and the impact it might leave on future generations. I'm not stupid. I know why I'm overweight. It's anxiety. <laughs> As a future physicist, I, I'm on a collision course with destiny. <laughs> They're probably going to use me to create some sort of super weapon to annihilate mankind, and I won't be able to stop it. Both become quick. I hate that I enjoyed that. All right. Like, I hate that Dan Schneider is actually funny. I mean, but to be fair, we all know that. We've watched the shows that he's created, so he's definitely a funny man. Um, but it doesn't not make him creepy, right? Um, and also, yes, Drake was, in fact, in Degrassi. But on top of that, like, this seems like a show that I would watch. This actually seems like a show that I would genuinely enjoy good lord he's already generating his own orbit that is a funny statement to make considering what we're gonna learn later on in this video i'm sure this is dan schneider to the left right here that's him that is dan schneider quickly known for their flippant attitude often leading to swordplay and disagreements and great physical comedy is derived from the fact that to put it bluntly dennis is very large and arvid is very thin but despite how they might disagree the pair always seem to make up because they are brothers in some way. Dennis is infamous for quite a few things in the show. He borrows money recklessly and never pays it back. He lies without need and gets caught in massive drama because of it. Oh. And he often has to deal with the repercussions of his various pranks or comedy material oh. not landing quite right. You know oh, it's paralleling real life. Did Dan Schneider play this character for so long that he basically became the character? Oh my goodness, guys. It is oh, it is aligning. It is aligning with real life. This is definitely foreshadowing for this video. But wow, that is crazy. You don't think it's funny? I'm not laughing, Dennis. You see, that's the difference between you and me. I take the existentialist point of view. Life is a joke. 
Do you know about existentialism? No, Dennis, I just got here from Mars. You want to play funny philosophy? Do you know Dante's The Divine Comedy? Because Dante says there are nine levels of hell. That's a comedy? <laughs> <laughs> Several other important... I can't. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm laughing because that was a funny line. That was actually pretty good. It wasn't even the laugh track that made me laugh. It was just funny and good. Important stories include the one where Dennis gets a job working at a diner to help pay back the money he owes all his friends. The double length event episode where the entire class gets to go overseas for a big competition. And the episode where Dennis tries to get his classmate Maria to help him write an essay for a big scholarship fund only for their plans to get held up by Maria's new boyfriend, Chuck. When you really- Is that Brad Pitt? With Dan Snyder, both in the same TV show? What is this show? I actually, okay, we, chat, I need to watch out of the class. I'm sorry, I know. I understand that I am going against everything that I'm, every point that I'm gonna make by the end of this video. But like, I genuinely need to watch this show to understand why Brad Pitt's in it. I just really need to know. Think about it, uh, Dennis. Life is short. Mm. And can we be honest? We are on this planet to party. <laughs> I don't think Nietzsche could have said it better. <laughs> Chuck, in simple words, is an idiot. He's a complete buffoon with no standing and no future, and he's played by the exact person you think he is. Look, Maria, I don't know, but I'm getting a little worried here that you, you have more interest for your schoolwork than you do in the old Chuck dog here. No, that's not true. Chuck isn't interested in dating a girl who is more intelligent than him, someone who's interested in books and learning rather than having fun and partying, and so Maria begins faking being stupid whenever he's around. Dennis uses this to his advantage, taking her name off of their award-winning paper while using the excuse that he's doing this to stop Chuck from finding out how smart she is. Eventually, Maria decides that she can't keep lying about who she really is, and she he reveals the truth cause what is this subplot right now that is such a crazy subplot that he stole her work because he wanted to appear ahead and she pretended to be stupid so she could keep her boyfriend and i'm sorry what saying chuck to break up with her now two other notable characters who survive to the end of the series are simone played by christine haje and eric played by Brian Robbins. Watch this. 30 August of 1980. Ozzy Osbourne eats his first rat on stage. <laughs> That's why you're not on the team, Eric. I'm not on the team because I don't want to be on the team. Eric is the bad boy of Millard Fillmore High, the delinquent who wants nothing to do with this preppy class of nerds or their academic team. However, testing has proven that he has a gifted mind, and his mother forces him to stay in the class to better himself. Simone is quite the different story. She's quiet, reserved, shy, and kind. She's obsessed with poetry, able to recite certain pieces from memory, and is a natural romantic at heart. Okay, Throughout the enough. series, Eric and Simone start a turid romance, constantly dating, breaking up, reconciling, becoming friends, before dating again and starting it all over. This That's like me and my ex, bro. I mean... If I had one, I don't, I don't engage in love or romance and no one really engages in that in me. That's not the point of this video. Cycle was disrupted during an important event story in season four when Simone and Dennis instead began dating. In the episode, we learned that the class had recently taken a field trip to the Statue of Liberty, only for the ship to rock and Simone to be knocked overboard into the bay, completely unconscious. What? Dennis had then hopped overboard to save her from drowning. In the episode, she begins dating him to show her appreciation for- but No one does this in real life. No one dates someone because they save their life, I hope. Is that a, th is that a thing that happens? Do people do this? Guys, like if, if someone saved your life, would you date them? Would you fall in love with them because they saved your life? Because I want to know, and whose life can I save? For him saving her life. This is something Dennis feels indulgent about before he develops a bad feeling about the whole thing. Oh no, Dennis, I really like you. Mm, I don't feel right about it. I mean, uh, what if I hadn't saved your life? I mean, what then? 
But you did. <laughs> Dennis, two days ago, you put your life at risk to save another's. How can I not like that? Mm. Oh, it's the ultimate test of honor, of decency. Oh, goodness. Face it, Dennis. You're good. Yeah. Wow. This is once again foreshadowing. It's. I feel like the message of this video is going to be like, can, can Dan Schneider prove after everything that he's good? Right after all the bad that he has done as the character of the show, and maybe as a person in real life, can he prove that he's good? Dennis eventually admits that she only nearly drowned because he accidentally hit her on the head with a life preserver while trying to rescue her. Okay, I take everything I just said back. I mean, I feel like this, I, I should have seen it coming. I really, I don't know why. I don't know why I did, I paused the video too early. That was the problem. However, if you're watching this video right now, guys, like I said, click the link down in the description down below. Watch the original video over on Quentin's channel. As you can see, my reaction is probably about twice as long as his original video, but that's just the point. It's a reaction video. I'm giving you my thoughts on top of Quentin's, and that's why you're here if you like these type of videos. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is very, very interesting so far. Causing her to become enraged that she let things get as far as them dating for something so stupid. But despite this, thanks to Mr. Moore, they're able to end the episode on relatively good terms. By most accounts, Dennis Blunden was not the most groundbreaking character in the history of sitcoms. If you look around at other shows from the same decade, you're likely to find a lot of other scheming funny guys acting out of selfish gain before learning a lesson that they won't retain. But perhaps the most notable thing about Head of the Class mm -hmm. and this character was the actor behind it all, a young 20-something by the name Daniel Schneider. Although it's important to say that this wasn't the first role that Daniel had in the entertainment industry. Years before the sitcom started, he had appeared in a long string of random bit roles, which included an infamous sex comedy film. Hot. That being 1985's Hot Resort. Bro, you can't say sex comedy film and then show the iCarly set. Bro, this, I, that threw me off. Okay, I should probably not keep this on screen either. Now remember, our motto here at the Royal St. Kitts is, the guest is always right. If he calls you an asshole, then you're an asshole. Weren't you in a movie with Fay Ray? <laughs> I don't what? suppose you'd like to go to the movies tonight. <laughs> Fuck off. Well, I guess a blowjob would really be out of the question then. Fuck you. Fuck me. Well, that's kind of what I had in mind. I am so uncomfortable right now. Dude, we are only 12 minutes in. Okay, this is, again, I am, I am starting to realize that Dan Schneider seems to have just become the characters that he used to play. And that, like, that's not unheard of, right? Like, if you play a character long enough, eventually you just become that person we've seen it happen a lot and and, and i mean i'm not gonna lie it's kind of sort of like not completely with me but it, it kind of sort of has happened with me like i've i've, I've been evanito for so long that like i feel like i've lost a little bit of evan <laughs> it's inside of it's out of what i play things up to be on the internet right like I, I had friends recently tell me because they were like yeah i'm definitely able to tell when evan's doing stuff for content versus doing stuff um for in, in real life or whatever because like when i talk to people normally i normally have like a more monotone tone but i've noticed in conversations a lot more that i've had this more high-pitched tone in regular conversation with friends and it, it, i don't know why i do it i know i'm not recording a video but like now these days when i'm talking to someone i'm like hey how's it going instead of like hey how's it going that i used to do so yeah when you do something for long enough you kind of just get stuck hi help me i really want to go back to being a monotone boring man Please. You know, which way do you like it? Because I got the People's Almanac, and it lists the six most favorite popular positions with women, especially women like you. I can tell because you have that kind of body. Have you been with a woman? You have that kind of body? Who wrote this script? He's not the problem here. I get it. But who wrote this script? I want to understand. Who sees a woman and says, you have that type of body, so I know that you'd be into this? Yes. But it was indisputably head of the class, which gave Schneider the connections and momentum to begin a long-term career in Hollywood. 
1988, Schneider and his co-star, Brian Robbins, were invited to co-host what most would call the very first Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. It was this brief gig, performed in front of a live audience at Universal Studios Hollywood, that would totally change the trajectory of both men's lives. The award show was produced okay. by a man named Albie Hecht, who soon formed a close friendship with both Schneider and Robbins. Hecht would eventually become the head of production at Nickelodeon, and would in turn invite his friends to come work on Nickelodeon productions. That makes sense. However, the pair had to turn such invitations down, as head of the class was an ABC project, oh. meaning they were obligated to that network until their contracts until expired. Ended, yeah, that makes sense. Luckily for them, that exact situation would come just three years later. Okay, you can't just say just three years later. Head of the class is a very, very, like, I mean, sorry, not three years is a very long time in general. Right? Like, I've, in the past three years, so much has happened in my life. I'm sure a lot has happened in your life. Um, you know, we had an entire pandemic. People thought the world was ending, and we survived. Five years on ABC, the kids from head of the class finally graduate. But the ceremony you'll see on the air wasn't half again as emotional as when the actors said goodbye after taping the final show. We've been doing this for a long time, and um, it means everything to me. Um, I would like to say what a privilege and an honor it has been. I'm sorry. <laughs> Daniel Schneider's mom missed his real graduation. She showed up for this one. So this time she. That's so funny, dude. My mom and my dad refused to come to my college graduation. It's something that I think of quite often. Um, my dad's dead now, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but my mom acknowledges that it was worth it. She's like, damn, you became a YouTuber. So like, honestly, I'm just saying like my degree panned out. If you're wondering what my degree was, I studied, um, visual effects, uh, you know, and that was it. If you're wondering what visual effects is, think of like advanced editing. That's basically what it is. So yeah, it worked. She showed up with, uh, the Dan look. I made it this time. So I've been, uh, I've been harassing her for about seven years now for not making it. Now I can't say anything. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the graduating class of Fillmore High School. After Head of the Class ended, Brian Robbins formed a production studio alongside Michael Tallinn, a producer and director who had been making sports documentaries as far back as 1978. In 1993, Albie Hecht invited Robbins to pitch to him a children's television series that could be produced by their new production studio to air on Nickelodeon. Robbins quickly conceived of what was essentially Saturday Night Live but for children. Yep. The series was soon yep. given the name All, All That, that. Yep. and Schneider was brought onto the project to serve as head writer. By the Dude, literally, this is a, this the 15 minutes we've watched so far has given me more information than the actual documentary that HBO or Discovery did, whatever the case, uh, that was on HBO Max. Like, this is, it provided more information on who Dan Schneider is as a person than, like, the other documentary, which is really cool. Like, these, this is crazy. At the end of the show's second episode, the team had struck gold. Welcome to Good Burger, yep. home of the Good Burger. Yep. Is there anything in my nose? I don't know. In 1996, yeah, literally, if the Good Burger episode of all that never came out, I don't think that people would have ever liked it. I think that Good Burger saved that show like a hundred percent saved it and i'm sure that maybe some of you watching this probably disagree with me but i think a lot more people would probably agree that the good burger bit saved it sick schneider would write the pilot episode of the all that spinoff keenan and, and Kel. Kel. Yep. the show would feature yep. another deep cut connection to head of the class as Keenan's skittish boss in the series, Chris Potter, is played by the same actor that had oh. starred as Arvid back in the 1980s. See, let be quiet. Keenan, this is coming out of your paycheck. Now clean up these puffs pronto. And Cal, you're fired. I don't work here. Well, see to it that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Both Robbins and Schneider would appear in different season one episodes as guest performers. But outside of this, Schneider rarely worked on Keenan and Kel, as he both retained his position as head writer of all that, and he began writing his first feature film, to be directed by Brian Robbins. This was, of course, 
good, good burger. burger along with this yeah yeah see dude i mean i'm just saying all right again i like i hate dan schneider as a person conceptually um but i have to recognize that he's like a creative genius it's kind of like logan paul a lot of people hate logan paul as a person a person sorry but conceptually and just realistically logan paul is a creative genius like especially if you look up logan paul's 99 originals documentary on youtube or his flat earth one those are both genius level videos some of the most creative and some of those best like just absolute best things i've ever seen in the entirety of the internet and it comes from logan paul who i'm sure a lot of people don't think is a good person and it's wild it's absolutely wild string of successes were some odd bumps along the way in 1994, Schneider would deliver one of his final standalone performances when he appeared in Tanya and Nancy, The Inside Story. This what? was one of the first docudrama films made about the career of Tanya Harding and the assault of Nancy Kerrigan. The film aired in April 1994, less than four months from the incident in question. And in many ways, it is obviously extremely rushed together. In the film, Schneider plays Tanya's bodyguard, Sean Eckerd. Call Shane. What? Just call Shane. <laughs> listen to me, you moron. If you can't handle the job, maybe we'll just hire somebody else. Uh, listen to me. Okay. Are you listening? Do you want to write this down? Here's the new plan. You're going to go to Detroit on a bus. I'm taking a bus yeah, all the way to Detroit? I'm going to pop on down to Phoenix in all four grand. I'll put up this nice new place, mirrors on the wall. Yeah, a bus. Live with it. You tell Galuli. If he doesn't come up with the rest of my money, I'm going to break his legs. What is this movie about? I'm very confused. I don't understand a single thing that was supposed to have happened there. 1998, Schneider left all that to focus his efforts on creating his very first sitcom. The series would be titled Guys Like Us and would air on the United Paramount Network, or UPN. I can't believe she cheated on me. It's never happened to me before. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, but you're... you... <laughs> okay, that's actually funny. I'm sorry, man. I can't. I like. I I'm not watching this video in intent of liking this man's shows any more than I already do. But to be fair, I I knew going into this that I already liked his shows. Like that much was obvious. I've watched a ton of them. I always thought that they were great shows. But I think that he's a very uh, 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 abhorrent person. Like he's awful in a lot of different aspects. <laughs> Guys Like Us is about Jared Harris, who has to raise his kid brother Maestro after their father decides to move to Venezuela for work. Jared often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city with the responsibilities of raising his little brother. The show was a massive flop with consistently low ratings and a finale that never even broadcast. And so Schneider pivoted taking over a pilot project intended for an all that cast member named Amanda Bynes. Thus, and the Amanda, the Amanda show, show was born, yep. starting a new era of success when it came to the works of Dan Schneider. When the series ended in 2002, Schneider helped create two different shows to succeed it. Yep. Drake and Josh, Drake and Josh, which aired on Nickelodeon, and What I Like About You, yep. which aired on the WB. What I Like About You is about Val Tyler, who has to raise her kid sister Holly after their father decides to move to Japan for work. Holly often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city. Bro, that obviously fake kiss between these two, dude. Like, they didn't actually even kiss. Like, she, like, you know how, like, when people fake kiss and, like, you could see that they're, like, actually just going around the person's neck or whatever? Like, that was, that was just very obvious. I'm not going to play it again, but that's just what happened there with the responsibilities of raising her teenage sister. His work on Drake and Josh would lead Schneider to create a sister show. Wait, hold on. What I like about you is basically a rehash of his first show. It's a show about this woman raising her teenage sister. The first show was about the dude raising his, like, kid son. Interesting. Interesting. Show titled Zoe 101, which would give him the momentum to later create many I had the biggest crush on Jamie Lynn Spears. I still have the biggest crush on Jamie Lynn Spears. She's a gorgeous woman, okay? I, listen, all right, I was younger. It was, it was there. I always say that Selena Gomez was my first crush, but I think I was wrong. Jamie Lynn Spears, dude, she was always there. Other projects, I have not such seen as Victoria, Sam and Cat, oh, Henry God. Danger, oh, and of course, 
iCarly. Oh, God. I'm triggered every single time I hear Victorious, dude. Victorious has changed the trajectory of my life. Like, I, I'm not going to go into details in this video as to why I hate Victorious a little too much because I think I've talked about it enough times. If you ever want to know why I hate Victorious, come to my stream, like, on Twitch, and I'll tell you there. All right? That's the only time I'll mention it iCarly is about Spencer Shea, who has to raise his kid sister Carly after their father decides to move vaguely overseas for work. Spencer often has to juggle the frustrations of maintaining a dating life in the city with While the responsibilities raising of raising his teenage oh sister. Oh my god, it's the same show! This man isn't a creative genius! He just rehashed the same idea several times! Dude! But also the internet's in there somewhere. Who can forget such classic original episodes as the story where Sam begins working at a fast food place to help pay back the money she owes all her friends. The double linked event episode where the entire gang gets to go overseas for a big competition. The episode- He's rehashing things that happened to him when he was working not only on his first show, but also when he was on um, that one show with the high schoolers or whatever. Dude. Oh my goodness. Dad Schneider is not a creative genius. He's like me. He just copies his homework. Like I'm reacting to Quentin's video right now, but we're not going to talk about that. Episode where Carly begins dating a boy who is smart and tries to hide the fact that she's stupid and he ends up breaking up with her when he finds out the truth. Or the episode where Carly starts dating Freddy after he saves her life, something he feels indulgent about before he develops a bad feeling about- It's the exact same plot! What? <laughs> when you- when you look back at these things, you know- in scrutiny and and like you actually get like a magnifying glass and realize these things it really just changes your perspective on some old media right dan strander is about as creative as reaction youtubers i know right tell me about it um please like the video and subscribe to the channel and i'll keep reacting to this one <laughs> about the whole thing dan schneider's work was exceptional because he didn't need to study sitcom culture. He had lived sitcom culture. He knew the tropes like the back of his hand, when to borrow ideas from old classics, and when to satirize and subvert. Sure, it's wholesome and endearing when the teacher with a failed background in theater is a wise mentor beyond his years. But what if instead, he was just insane and borderline a threat to everyone around him? Sure, usually you expect oh characters like Dennis God. Blunden fueled by selfish schemes. As kids, you never cared about it. You just enjoyed the shows, but as an adult, you understand what's behind everything. That is absolutely correct. But oh my God. We'll learn a lesson and get their comeuppance. But sometimes it's fun if every character is Dennis and there is no lesson and there is only chaos oh my god victorious is just a show where every character was dennis which is dan snyder's character from the other show dude we all just learned that dan snyder's shows are just shows about characters playing him when he was in that show 30 years after the premiere of all that the impact the series had on the careers of everyone involved is impossible to deny. Today, Brian Robbins, the same man who was once the edgy bad boy on Head of the Class, who hosted the first Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, produced all that, Keenan and Kel, and directed Norbit, is the CEO of Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon. Oh! It makes sense now! He, oh, no, that dude, I was wondering the entire time, why was this man never let go? Why was this man never fired? Why, 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 why he worked so long with Dan Schneider? That just changes your perspective on literally everything. This is not the reason that I canceled my Paramount Post gun. It could be though. In many respects, Brian Robbins has become Paramount's own Lorne Michaels with his influence and impact through his producing credits being almost immeasurable. And this ongoing power that he still wields in the industry highlights a certain awkward absence. In just under 25 years at the network, Dan Schneider became arguably 
one of the most influential voices in children's entertainment, alongside being one of the most successful sitcom creators of that entire decade. And he's also a person that we don't talk about. This has caused one of the Dude, most content- 20 minutes into the video and we're finally hitting the title sequence, bro. I mean, we're 36 minutes into my reaction to it. So like, I, you know, I think that we've discovered that Dan Schneider at this point is a terrible person, right? Are we all on the same page still, right? I wonder if they all, they're still going to open the time capsule they buried in the Nickelodeon Universal Studios in the 90s that said it could be open in 2042. Oh my goodness, hopefully they do. Anxious discrepancies in Nickelodeon history. Dan Schneider's work is almost universally loved by contemporary audiences. You might not like every Schneider's project to ever release, but for nearly every single one, every single thing that he worked on, you can find someone from the time who will call it the greatest thing to ever be put out by Nickelodeon. However, Schneider is not exactly someone with a clean record. And so people have essentially begun to divorce him from his own content. And the reason is that doing this is one of the only ways that we can go on thinking so highly of a huge chunk of material from our childhoods. It's a lot harder to rewatch The Good Burger Movie or any classic episodes of Zoe 101 or iCarly or Victorious if they just remind you of the rather disastrous allegations which have since been made against the man behind it all. And so, makes sense. we don't talk about Dan Schneider. We don't speak his name, we don't remember his face, and we don't think of his creations as coming from anywhere, having any source. Unless there's a problem with one of these projects, something infamous that we're not fond of. In that case, we're all far too ready to shake our fists in the air and take his name in vain. But as I discovered, the further we get into Schneider's output, the harder it becomes to forget that he exists. To Unfortunately, like it's it's not something that only happened in the Nickelodeon pieces of media, but it's happened in other forms of media as well, where like there are really bad people out there who have created some of the greatest things that we enjoy. And sometimes you're just like, I hate the fact that this terrible person created this good thing. Yes, that is most of Hollywood, uh, Andrew. To not look at his properties through the lens of something created by him is to deny them their actual content. And all to just keep up this lie that the library of Dan Schneider still works in the modern decade, when in many ways, that arguably isn't always the case. And so today, I am going to break the only rule of analyzing the NSU. I am going to talk about Dan Schneider. So when I started working on this miniseries back in 2020, there were a lot of things that I could not have anticipated. Now, I always wanted to end the series with a conversation about this topic. I wanted to end things right here. But a lot has changed. We have a lot more information than true. we used to. But the main thing is that this has all become a lot more personal to me. And I don't mean personal in the sense that it's serious now and it wasn't serious before. Okay. I mean that I often feel like I have become trapped in the gravitational force of the collapsing star that is Dan Schneider. Be yeah, a lot of people, I think, just associate Quentin now with the NSU and Nickelodeon properties in general. I mean, I did. The moment all this stuff was uh, popping up on Twitter and when I watched the um, Quiet On Set documentary, I immediately thought, well, what is Quentin's response to this going to be? To be fair, why I'm watching this right now, I just, I genuinely want to know, you know? Because of that, the video I'm going to make today is explicitly not the video I would have made in 2021. And additionally, I think it's very important that we start things off by laying down some very basic ground rules. Okay. These rules are very important to me, and I think a lot of people are going to disagree with my rules. But I decided to set some base standards, and these are the stipulations that... 
I have come up with. Okay. Rule number one. I don't want to get sued. Okay. That's fair. This rule will influence all of my other rules. Okay. Rule number two. <laughs> I will only be discussing claims and allegations which have an actual source. Things that are on the record that have been said in interviews, in articles, in books, in documentaries. That's fair. If it comes from an anonymous source giving tips to a TikTok creator or some forum post on a shady website, no. I'm sorry, but no, absolutely not. That's actually the smartest course of action here because, you know, you don't want to get a defamation lawsuit, right? Like that would suck. So it makes sense that he's only doing that. Rule number three, and this is the big one, if someone insists that they did not experience abuse on these sets or with any of these people, I'm not going to call them liars, I'm not going to accuse them of having Stockholm Syndrome, and I'm not going to put them on blast for that. And if someone thinks that they aren't a part of the overarching narrative of abuse at Nickelodeon, I'm not going to include their story in this video. I've been keeping my ear to the ground about this conversation for a while now, okay, and I fair. found a lot of the discourse kind of frustrating privately. And the main reason is that in recent years, this topic has really been picked up by true crime YouTube, which is a polite way of what? saying that people are making shit up for fun. Because in the true crime podcast Yo. scene, it is common to exaggerate speculate fill in the blanks a little hey if this one thing is true who knows what might else be true i mean there's no way to really say and whenever i've been vocally frustrated about this in public i sometimes get a little bit of pushback and people sometimes accuse me of defending dan schneider this is like when people were accusing me of defending Nickelodeon, which is Nickelodeon, wow, Niji Sanji, which is really stupid, right? Because like we're on the same page. I do not like Niji Sanji as a company, but just because I refuse to call Niji Sanji a black company, all of a sudden I'm a bad person and I'm defending them, which is just a really unfortunate take. And I do not understand how you can gather that from, from me saying the exact same thing that you as a person are saying, except for the fact that I would call him a black company. So yeah, I wouldn't say that he's defending uh, Dan Schneider if he's not necessarily going ahead and believing um, you know, rumors instead of hard evidence. I think that what he's doing makes sense. And they say to me, hey, this is a bad guy. This is an awful guy. So why are you questioning these rumors about him? Because the truth matters. No, I agree. And I would love to change that, but it's above my pay grade. And that doesn't stop being a reality just because it is more interesting yeah. to just treat truths and untruths as equally valid in the realm of discourse. That's true. That's actually fair. I think that it's always uh, better to judge someone based on what you know versus what you think happened in a certain scenario, right? Like... I mean, I said it at the start, to be fair. Like, I think Dan Schneider is very creative. Um, but, you know, obviously he's done a, really, a lot of bad things. Now, I don't have any proof. So I should probably save my butt right now by saying that everything that is discussed here is also just allegations. And, you know, I mean, if the truth comes out and a judge decides in the end, then, hey, I will believe it is completely true. And if you force me to sit here and go through a hundred rumors with no source about things that people believe Dan Schneider might have done, I have not seen all any of that stuff. accomplishes. Were there actually TikToks like this? Is it devalues the actual list of things that he very much almost certainly did do? And that list is not a list of good things. So I would prefer to focus on the stuff that has evidence. Yeah. And with that, I am going to jump right into where I think we need to start off. Part one, Dan Schneider, the brand. So far in this video, we have discussed a wide range of projects that Dan Schneider took part in over his 32 years working on television. But when it comes to shows where Dan Schneider acted as a proper showrunner, he is most associated with nine programs. All that, The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, iCarly, Victoria, Sam and Cat, Henry Danger, and Game Shakers. This represents well over two decades of children's content. With this comes the reality that a 
a lot of children grew up with this man's productions, mm -hmm. and a lot of people still watch these shows to this very day. This is important because of the conversation of how intertwined Dan Schneider is with his writing. I'll be tackling my opinions on this later, but in short, a lot of people have actively avoided crediting Dan Schneider for projects that they think highly of. And I think what this does is erase the very explicit brand that Schneider had successfully built up over the 20 some odd years he was at the network. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to go ahead and like not credit the man for the work that he actually did. At the end of the day, he actually did still do a great show. Thank you for the raid, by the way. Um, hope you're having a wonderful time. But yeah, like I, I, I genuinely think that like Dan did create really good shows and it is important to acknowledge that he created really good shows. Also, Sick is in my chat saying, come to the, my streams more often is what he means to say. Now, in many ways, this was subtle and easy to miss when you were a kid. Even the most innocent stuff was borderline subliminal. But here's a quick example of what I'm talking about. In iCarly Season 2, Episode 5, I Go to Japan, we are shown the iWeb Awards, and specifically, we see several contestants go on the stage while the gang are stuck with security. In the background of this shot, we see a woman representing the best online cooking show. As the gang run Inside, we briefly see a clip of this woman's segment. Hey, that's enough shaking. The onions are ready for Fiber, action. yum. If you listened closely there, you might have heard the specific stock audio file used whenever a special cameo happens in one of these shows. So who was this woman and why was her cameo so important? Well, this is Lisa Lillian, the owner of the online brand Hungry Girl, which was also huh. a TV show in the early 2010s. Huh? And she is also Who? Dan Schneider's wife. Oh, okay. Well, I, that's, um, I, I really sat here questioning who this woman was. I really did. I, I, was, I was very, very confused. I didn't even know he had a wife. I, I really didn't. I, you know, what am I doing? Okay, this man, with all of his faults, found love. And I'm sitting here at 31 years old without the love of my life. I must be doing something wrong. Dan Schneider is a wife guy who made a long running joke on all of his shows of depicting his wife as one of the most famous chefs in the world, with her show being watched by characters in several different shows. In fact, when the iCarly opening sequence starts, have you ever noticed this weird stock art of a brunette woman in the corner? As a kid, I always assumed this was supposed to be Carly, but it's not. That's Dan Schneider. Schneider's wife. Specifically, it's Oh my god, despite him being awful, he loves his wife. That's crazy. We have found out that Dan Schneider, despite everything, puts his wife above everything. That's crazy. That's insane. Lisa's art sona that she uses on her website and her cookbooks. Now, an annoying trend I've found when you point out any fact about Dan Above, Schneider yeah. is that everyone tries to read it as sounding sinister. You know, you put creepy background music behind it, you make the image black and white, and you do an invert effect, and it's like, oh, this is the most creepy thing. So I just want to be clear about this. There is nothing wrong with hiding your wife in the shows that you make. Yeah. But I think it's a very- There's literally nothing wrong with that. I think that's absolutely fine. Like, I feel like if I had a wife and if I was madly in love with her, obviously if I made TV shows that were highly successful, I would hide her in like everything that I did, right? It just, it makes sense as a creator, right? Interesting example of the many ways that Dan's presence is felt in these shows, even if he wasn't one of the actors. But that is, of course, ignoring that sometimes he is an actor. For instance, alongside his Keenan and Kel guest episode, sure. he appears as Mr. Bailey in Good Burger, Mr. Oldman in The Amanda Show, as the taxi driver in the Zoe 101 semi-finale Chasing Zoe, as the Secret Service agent in the Michelle Obama iCarly episode. Bro, that episode was so crazy, by the way. Michelle Obama and iCarly is iconic, dude. Can we talk about, for a second here, how good of an actor Michelle Obama 
and Barack Obama were. Like, those two were just really good at acting. I, to be fair, they're politicians, right? So that kind of makes sense. It kind of checks out. But, like, at the same time, like, B Obama and Michelle, like, you put them in any situation. They could be funny. They could be serious. They could be the kings and queens of America. But somehow we didn't vote for that to happen. I'm just saying, listen, I'm a little bit biased. But, like, they were great. They were absolutely great. And in the iCarly finale, he cameos as the mechanic that Sam steals from. And in All That and The Amanda Show, he constantly appeared in several other guest roles, and occasionally as himself. To top this off, Schneider would do voice cameos in so many episodes of so many different shows that it is impossible to keep track of. His identifiable nasally yell can be heard in essentially every project he worked on from 1994 to 2018. It's the Pajeli Hucho! Okay, okay, you're the ninth caller, which means you've won two tickets and backstage passes to Zero Gravity. Welcome, yoga people. Namaste. I wouldn't want it any other way. Maximum dancing! Love me! He was also in Grand Theft Auto Vice City. But what? the most infamous example- Wait, no, you can't just say that and stop. He was in Grand Theft Auto Vice City? Hello? Uh, can we get like, can someone, can someone find that for me? I need to know. I need to understand what part he had in Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Of the hidden references to Schneider are the subliminal ones. Referencing Dan Warp. Dan Warp. Yeah, what is Dan Warp? Dan Warp is Schneider's official blog and social media brand. Here, he would post behind the scenes information and personal stories. Specifically during the era of iCarly and Victorious, mm. Dan had begun the practice of hiding Easter eggs referencing his own brand, under the guise that this would inspire viewers to follow him online. His handle was added to the logo of Schneider's Bakery, and iCarly characters would be seen wearing such shirts as Dan Warp Tweets and Follow Dan Warp. But the issue is grander than just- Interesting, dude. He followed Logan Paul's strategy of always plugging. That's actually kind of crazy. Imagine if I wore my own merch in every video or in every stream. Like, I just wore my merch all the time to subliminally tell you guys to buy my merch. Like, which you should do right now, by the way. If you lose the link down in the description down below, there should be a link there to buy my merch. Just, I mean, just do it, right? Look at it. It looks cool. Just, please, actually. A Schneider promoting himself. I think the bigger conversation is about Nickelodeon promoting Schneider. Growing up, it was not uncommon for Nickelodeon to broadcast segments illustrating Schneider as the genius who single-handedly created a media empire and shared universe. And why wouldn't they do this? Thanks to Schneider, they were making millions off of several iconic franchises, not to mention the international Nickelodeon stars that were created because of his work. But behind the scenes, things were never so simple. Part 2. The Case Against Dan Schneider Okay. So a lot of people tend to discuss the allegations of Dan Schneider all at once and with some vagueness. And from my experience, this is typically done to build kind of a foundation of implication. To say, hey, here's a little bit of one piece information and another piece information. Now why don't you use your imagination and kind of think about what you think might have happened, you know, kind of in the sidelines there. I hate this. I think it's hackneyed, unjournalistic nonsense, and I will not be taking part. That's I will say that Quinton's approach at this is actually very sound. Um, him actually wanting to find circumstantial evidence instead of just being like, oh, Dan Schneider likes feet. That's weird, right? Is, is a lot better than most people's approaches. I've seen people in my chat, my own friends, um, and, you know, who have said this stuff. And I, I'm sure at certain points, I've probably also joked about it as well. But yeah, like it is definitely important that, you know, people understand that there are things that Dan Schneider did that were definitely weird. Uh, and there are things that he did that were definitely outright wrong. Right. I think his treatments of the like women at Nickelodeon are really, really awful. But I think his love for feet is just strange. If that if that makes sense. Right. That's why I think it's important that we talk about the actual specifics of what has been said and piece by piece. 
So first of all, we need to discuss the disastrous work culture on these shows. When you were hired on a Dan Schneider production, there was an expectation that you work long hours and you'd be available 24-7 if anything were to come up. The average weekday work session could go from 13 to 20 hours, and most weekends were spent at Dan's house trying to workshop ideas. One specific claim made in a New York Times article is that Schneider would sometimes ask the other writers to wheel him around, literally wheel him around in his office chair from room to room so he could keep working on a laptop in between moving from place to place. Arthur Granstein, a writer on Drake and Josh, iCarly, and Victorious, made this claim to the New York Times in 2021. I will always be grateful to Dan for taking a chance on me as a rash young writer fresh out of college and for all I learned over the next six years. Much of my experience with him was a blast. He could be generous and validating, and it was exciting to be around his talent and passion for creating entertainment. But he was also unreasonably demanding, controlling, belittling, and vindictive, with a willful disregard for boundaries or workplace appropriateness. Yeah, and I think that's the, the best that example people of need this to probably we- focus on instead of like people who focus on just the feet stuff, right? Like the feet stuff, again, very weird, but like what he did inside of the workplace and how, again, specifically for me, how he treated women is just really bad. We now have was on Dan's first standalone television hit, The Amanda Show. When The Amanda Show first started, the showrunners hired two women for the writer's room, Christy Stratton and Jenny Kilgan. One of the main stipulations of them being hired was that they would work for a shared fee, both of them taking home half of what a male writer would be paid at that time. And that first part there is just blatantly illegal. You can't just give someone, there are two people, one salary and tell them to share it. Like, that just doesn't make sense. Imagine if you go to work at let's say mcdonald's which i think currently in california pays um twenty dollars an hour right like let's just say actually you know let's look at it from the worst angle texas i think in texas they pay um fifteen dollars an hour right so let's say you're going in and the men get paid maybe 15 an hour in texas um in in some states they get paid like 750 an hour actually you know even worse let's look at it from like another state where they pay probably like seven dollars and fifty cents an hour and let's say the men get seven dollars and fifty cents an hour in this unknown state um and you know the women when they walk in they're like hey you guys got you have to share a salary and so instead of you getting paid your 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 seven dollars and fifty cents an hour you're getting paid like three dollars and 25 cents an hour and and you just have to live with that. that is screwed up that is not okay and i think that that right there that's a that's a very evil thing that that man did and you know i i don't like that like at all at time on their very first day on set dan declared that women were incapable of being funny comedians and he challenged the two of them to prove him wrong the elephant in the room is that it is extremely ironic to declare that women can't be funny when you're the showrunner on a program called the Amanda, the Amanda show, show. Wait, like, where the lead star is a teen female comedian. Yeah, it's so dumb. But uh, you have to remember, the Amanda show wasn't actually the show Dan wanted to be making. He wanted to be making guys like us. The Amanda show was just the only option he had left. Dan was the definition of someone with improper workplace boundaries. He was often cracking jokes at the expense of others, and especially the women, and he would even show pornography on the workplace computers. While Dan attempted to present himself as just a big kid who was crafting a fun work environment, everyone quickly learned that he had a fierce temper that could change him in an instant. And when Dan walked into a room, you never knew which Dan you were going to get. And yet, Schneider was so successful and so massive at the network that many felt pleasing him was the only opportunity they had at continuing their careers. And one can only imagine that if the adults were walking on eggshells around him, the the kids must have been feeling about the same. You know, and it's unfortunate, right? Because when I watched Quiet Unsaid and all of this was being explained in that documentary, I felt the same way, um, not only about like, you know, how how do the kids feel in the show, but like the show, or I guess modern day content creation, echoes a lot of what these people have to deal with with the show and just, you know, entertainment in general, where a lot of times you'll see or like, you know, you'll you'll hear of people 
um, or at least I, I know of people in this industry who are blatantly horrible people. But I can't tell you that because I'm trying to make sure that my career is okay. And you might say, well, Evan, you're just snaking for them and like you're actually allowing them to continue being horrible. But I still want my job, right? At the end of the day. Uh, and, and that goes for most creators. Like a lot of creators, we deal with knowing that a lot of these other creators are horrible. Does that make us horrible people? I don't think so. We're just trying to keep what we have, right? And not have everything crumble beneath us, right? Uh, and, and it sucks. It really does suck that you just have to put up with this. And like, you know, these people, when they were working there, you have to remember they had to put up with that because for them, it, it was a paying job. They were like, we need to keep doing this because it puts food on our table. And, and that sucks. And I hate that that is the industry that the entertainment industry is. It, it like in all facets of it, it is just horrible. The cast members on All That and The Amanda Show were little, little kids, you know, 12 to 14 years old for the most part. And they were spending those important developmental years worrying about financially supporting their families and continuing their careers after they stopped being cute little angels. People the idea the of trying to- of If I don't uh, let this person, this person probably abuses it this way, it does, I might lose my opportunity to make my dreams come true, so I must stay nothing and let it happen and unfortunately it still happens yeah without it they could get blacklisted from working again really no absolutely that's literally how hollywood is it is so easy to get blacklisted in hollywood and it is also so easy to get blacklisted being a youtuber streamer or entertainer or vtuber whatever it like it they are very similar in in how these things operate and it, it, it sucks it is just very bad to overload yourself with work to maximize the profit you can make off of your own youthfulness it is a very unhealthy idea for a little kid trying to figure things out. And if there was something in the material that these kids didn't like that made them uncomfortable, they weren't going to go up against Schneider because this was the guy who decided if they got a big line, if they got a special skit, and even if they got their own spinoff. Yep. And even the parents who saw what Dan was doing and didn't like it, they were scared to go up against him because they knew that would have an effect on their children's lives that is true like he like if you spoke up against him it was documented there was like one parent that like spoke up against him and you know like her and her kid basically got booted off the show right because they were like hey like that's a little weird that's making us a little bit uncomfortable and you know dan was like cool whatever you're not coming back that is like that's just how the industry works not to mention the fact that these kids were performing grueling hours to the point that pretty much every week they were breaking child labor laws just to get that shoot in the can. And after the Amanda show, this only got worse. To quote one of Dan's main editors, and this is taken from the Investigation Discovery Quiet On Set documentary, when I worked with Dan, I felt like the bar was always being risen, and I had to reach that bar. You had to be as good or better or put more hours in or do longer things than Dan did. And we all did it, or you got fired. I would be editing from 8 a.m. to midnight. You didn't eat, you didn't go to the bathroom. One day, I keeled over, and I ended up having to go to the hospital. And as I'm leaving and curled over, I could hear someone say, how is the show going to get finished? But the worst story- I have been in exact positions like this editing for other YouTubers where I have gotten sick. I have been blatantly like, you know, like, I, like I'm, I'm actually just physically dying and they've just been like, well, you gotta get it done, right? And I no longer am I working for people like that. Like the people that I work for these days are a lot nicer about stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it has sucked. And, and, you know, I know of a lot of people who are still working under conditions like that uh, with other YouTubers in this industry. It like, it is not the best when you have to work for someone with an ego and don't get me wrong i have one as well obviously but like i think that i try to be nicer to the people that edit my videos like if if an editor comes to me and they're like yo i can't get this done in the week that you gave me i i'm like okay that's fine and i try to work something out with them i'm like okay maybe i can like that but like yeah it's it, it is it is so horrible man and like hearing people like working under dan having to go through that i i feel for them i'm sure you guys hearing this like you obviously feel for them as well like it's it is it is an industry that demands so much from you. And like, you know, obviously not every set is like this. Not every person is like this. But Dan was definitely one of the worst, I, I would say. Sorry about Schneider's activity on set was when he asked Christy Stratton 
to act out being sodomized while telling a story about high school. Chris that alone is one of the worst freaking things that I have heard. And again, I don't know if you know what being sodomized is. I don't really want to be the one to explain it in this video, but please Google it. And also it, things become a lot more inappropriate in this video, I'm sure. But like when I watched the documentary, they became so inappropriate that I was very uncomfortable. But that one, that was one of the things that made me absolutely uncomfortable. I think me and my friends, like we paused and I, I just needed a moment when we heard that part because I was like, that, that is the most unbelievably crazy thing that I have heard. How do you ask a woman to pretend like she's being sodomized while one, this is the crazy part, pretending like she's in high school, bent over a desk, like it, it, while she's like supposed to be working something. It's like, that is just a crazy thing to ask someone that works for you to do, right? Like that's unfortunate. Yeah, horribly Christy degrading. Christy followed Dan's directions to her utter humiliation. Jenny Kilgan witnessed this herself and recalled in the documentary, it was probably the wrongest thing I've ever seen happen to a woman in a professional environment ever. Later, Christy and Kilgan learned that it was actually against the rules of the Writers Guild of America for two writers to split a single wage. They complained to the union who quickly mm -hmm. came down on Schneider. Dan called up Kilgan, screaming at her, and saying that if he found out that she was the one who sabotaged the show, she would never work for Nickelodeon or Viacom ever again. It is so crazy when you actually hear people say this, right? And it is so crazy that they can actually get away with stuff like that, right? Like, I, they, dude, it, it, they are VTubers who I am aware of who have said stuff like this to other VTubers who have blatantly said that they will make sure that they never get their name out there in this industry. And it sucks because I know that these people actually have that influence and power. I'm not going to say who they are because you guys love them. I'm not trying to take that away from you, but it, it sucks. I see this still happening in this industry. It, it really does suck. I had to look up what sodomized uh, is and I gasped out loud. I never heard that word uh, till the documentary. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely abhorrent. Like, it, it's disgusting. It really is. Shortly after this, Dan fired Christy and Kilgan quit weeks later. Mm -hmm. The pair were replaced by a single male writer, Stephen Malaro, the future creator of Young Sheldon and Nun Pizza Left Beef. What? As dinky as the series might have been, Nun, wait, Nun Pizza Left Beef. Wait, actually, that's actually kind of funny. I'm sorry. I did, we just went from a very serious topic to, to none pizza left. <laughs> that was funny. Writing for a series like The Amanda Show was a huge opportunity in the industry, which is why these stories are so disappointing. After quitting, Kilgan sued Schneider for gender discrimination, which was settled out of court. The third element we need to talk about is the proximity that Schneider had to many of his child stars. In the documentary Quiet on Set, various people from The Amanda Show recall how extremely close Schneider and Amanda were. She'd often be so close to him that they'd be borderline cuddling and- Bro, he's hover-handing, dude. Look at this. That, that, that is a hover-hand right there. It's still very uncomfortable to watch, but he is hover-handing. We have to acknowledge that at the very least. It wasn't uncommon for Schneider to receive back rubs from Amanda Bynes. Ha! This tendency for him to yeah. physically touch his child stars is yeah. present in several yeah. very infamous photos. On top of this, his reputation for asking women on set for massages, be they adults or children, is well documented by many, many sources and is one of the most clear examples of sexual harassment from Schneider going across two and a half decades, if not more. Yep. When Amanda Bynes attempted yeah. to emancipate herself from her family. Yeah, no, the, that sort of stuff, that is what I think that we should be focusing on. A lot of people, again, we talked about it earlier, they just focus on the feet. That, this man has done so many worse things. And, and a lot of people just focus on the feet. He's a horrible human being because he did X, Y, and Z, not because he likes feet, guys, right? Schneider sided with her. He allegedly offered her help in her court case and even offered her a place to stay with him and Lisa. This is a very tense topic to discuss because Amanda Bynes has a difficult relationship with her family. And I could definitely see someone making the case that if Bynes attempted to emancipate herself, Schneider supporting her 
could be a good thing or a bad thing, just really depending on how you, how you look, look at, at it. it. Yeah, As documented sense. by several people, Dan certainly had a trend with the kids he would work with. He'd pick one person out, he'd tell them they were going to be a star with his help, and then he'd love bomb them with praise. Until time passed, he would become more passive about his investment in them, and then he would inevitably pick out a new kid to be his next starlet. A really obvious example, if we're talking about stuff in this miniseries, is that when Victoria started, Tori was presented as this ever-perfect golden child. But then as the show went on, the later seasons became yep. very extensively deprecating yep. at her expense. Yep. And that's a very frustrating example of this because, of course, a lot of Victoria's fans blame Victoria Justice. And yep. I don't really understand why. Like, it's not her fault. Like, they're blaming her even though that's the role, that's the character that she was given, right? It, it, you know, obviously, after that, Dan Schneider went ahead and, like, picked out um, Ariana Grande to go ahead and help lead Sam and Cat, right? But, like, I think his goal was to, like, maybe have Victoria Justice go ahead and, like, be, like, a, a, a superstar or whatever. But it, it, it sucks. It really does suck. Also, let's catch up with the chat right now. Like the foot uh, thing is so big when describing Dan since it's something we've all seen and cannot deny it. it's what he's been known for for a hot minute. That's fair. That's fair. It's just horrible seeing this makes me wonder how bad it's going to be when all the Vince Miana stuff comes out. Uh, geez. I mean, I don't know. Like, I've heard some stuff on uh, Vince. I mean, I don't know if there was like any evidence against a lot of it, but like, I've heard things. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it actually like does come to light. Because if it has to be said, Victoria Justice did not write the show Victorious. On top of this, Dan tended to keep the personal phone numbers of his cast members. He would often text them during off hours, as well as have dinner with them. He would even invite them all to his house for various holiday parties. Look who's here. Uh-oh, trouble. McCurry. Trouble. Hello. Hello. Now, something I've seen a lot of people say. I don't know if that part's weird, though, right? Like, I mean, if you're working with your boss and they invite you to a party or to hang out and stuff. I think that's right for the most part. Is that because such poor boundaries were in place, something must have happened. But this is the wrong way to look at this. Yeah, no, I The agree. correct logic is this. Something could have happened, thus there should have been better boundaries. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, yep. the hardest part no, about- I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that take, right? Like. The people thinking like, oh my God, stuff happened when, again, th apparently nothing ever did. But like, yes, there something could have happened. There should be boundaries. I absolutely agree with that logic, you know? Interesting a discussion about this is that so many people believe that Dan Schneider is automatically guilty of child sex abuse. And it's not just that they believe it, it's that they need it to be true. And I, I don't know why for the life of me. So when we talk about Dan Schneider and child abuse. Please keep in mind that for the most part, we are talking about inappropriate boundaries and severe, intense, emotional abuse. Yep. In her book, I'm Glad My Mom Died, Jeanette McCurdy gives extensive descriptions of how the creator was on set. According to McCurdy, if an actor got a line wrong or messed up a take, it wasn't uncommon for Schneider to go into a fit of rage, screaming in the child's face, even when we're talking about actors as young as six years old. All that cast member Angelique Bates recalled to Business Insider a similar story about Schneider yelling at her after she messed up a sketch. This caused her to run off the set crying. When she joined all that, she was 14 years old. Amanda Showcast- And that is just awful, right? Like that, that, that part, like stuff like that is what we should be scrutinizing him for. And, and, and it, it makes a lot more sense. Like the man is awful. I, I agree with people that think that he is awful, but I don't think that people should think he's awful for things that he didn't actually do, right? Like Dan Schneider, you know, for, for lack of a better term, he's not a pedophile. Right. We've never gotten circumstantial evidence or proof that he is a pedophile. He's a, he's a horrible man who has done horrible things, but they're not the things that you think that he's done, not the things that you keep hearing that he's done. He's just awful in different ways. Right. Member Raquel Lee Boileau recalled similar situations during the Quiet On Set miniseries. Dan was like a tornado. He'd come in and like, whew, 
and you'd be like, wow, okay, what just happened? The set would not feel the same when he would leave because everyone was on their toes, scared. One of the most infamous mm -hmm. examples of this was on the set of Zoe 101, as later recalled by Alexa Nicholas. When Zoe 101 was in production, it's been said that there was kind of a cool kid click that affected the atmosphere of the set. The main star of the show, Jamie Lynn Spears, was a former All That cast member and the sister of pop star Britney Spears. Yep. And essentially, everyone on set wanted to be in her good graces, yep. including the adults. Jamie Lynn allegedly decided that she didn't like Alexa very much, and so everybody on set was kind of going back and forth as you do as a teenager, picking sides and causing a bunch of, you know, teen drama. That makes now, sense. Now, I will get flack for this, but when it comes to the discussion of who is to blame for a situation like this, I do not blame teenagers for acting like teenagers. Yeah. And I'm not really interested in getting mad at an adult because when they were 14, they acted 14. Yo, but in situations like no, that, again, that checks out. That is very sound logic so far. Everything he's saying so far, I absolutely like agree with, right? Like, you know, like if, if you excommunicate someone when you're a child, that's just something you did when you were a child. There's no ifs and, uh, you know, ifs and buts about it, right? this where there's going to be so many kids on set i think the adults who are there have responsibilities and it's mm -hmm. the same responsibilities that you would expect from a teacher or a counselor or a principal and i think that really influences my opinion of what happened next so one day on the zoe 101 set alexa is minding her own business when who appears around a corner out of nowhere but britney spears Brittany has been debriefed by Jamie Lynn about all the onset drama and she has decided to put up a fight for her sister. And so she goes up to Alexa and she starts screaming in her face until Alexa is sobbing and crying, curled up in a fetal position on the ground. Now, I've been told that Brittany actually reflects on this story in her autobiography and that she was pregnant and she really regrets it. And Brittany's relationship with Jamie Lynn is a whole other thing. So sometime later, Alexa is summoned to a chamber of executives. Her mother isn't there, but who is there is Dan Schneider. And Dan allegedly begins screaming in her face about what happened. Why would you scream in the child's face after they just got screamed in the face of Britney? Like, you just had Britney Spears scream at her and you scream at her again. Like, what part of that makes sense? Like, the child is obviously disheveled at this point. They, they, they're, they like, uncomfortable. They're hurt. Don't scream at them again. And he yells specifically, the show's called Zoe 101, not Nicole 101. His stance is that Alexa is disposable, the show doesn't need her, and because of that, she is in the wrong for any incidents that happen on set. Yikes. I hate that logic, but I've heard someone tell me almost an exact thing. When, when people tell you that you are disposable in this industry, it absolutely does suck, but that is a yikes and a half, dude. This is a child. Right, like I'll take that from someone because I'm an adult, and I'll be like, right, sure, whatever. But like this, this is a what a 14 year old girl. Why are you telling a 14 year old girl that she is disposable? That sucks. That is absolutely unfortunate. And she just got yelled at by one of the biggest pop stars in the world, Britney Spears. And then you yell at her again and tell her, hey, stop messing around because we could get rid of you. How is the child supposed to feel? Like that, that causes like everlasting trauma. That takes years. Of therapy to try to undo right and, and I, I just don't know if you can undo stuff like that alexa again without her mother is left crying in a room filled with adults who only want to scream at her after this she tells her mother she wants to quit and nickelodeon lets her out of her contract if you walk away from this video only remembering one thing that i have said about this man let it be this the story of Dan Schneider is the classic cautionary tale of the honorary adults and the honorary cool kid.
These actors Dan was working with, they believed themselves to be grown up. They might have been 13, 14, 15, 16, but they were in that space being creative. So in their minds, they might as well have been 21 or older. And so to them, they were the same as all of these adults that they were supposed to be trusting. And Dan was the guy who believed himself to just be one of the kids. He was a part of the gang and he just happened to be a bit of an old soul. And so whenever there would be one of these classic cases where it was time for Dan to step up and be the adult in the room, he wouldn't do it. I think that's one of his biggest failings when it comes just to how he interacted with kids. Yeah, he's definitely not like a good role model in any capacity. He's like, which sucks, right? Like that that absolutely sucks. You put someone like this in charge and they're not a good role model. Like you're just going to ruin a lot of lives, unfortunately, right? Incidentally, why I think a lot of these former child stars, if not most of them, are totally shocked when all this bad stuff comes out about him. Because, oh, not Dan. Not our Daniel. Couldn't be precious Daniel. The next thing is probably one of the most infamous cases that can be made against Dan Schneider. The sexualization of the kids on his shows. Now, I think this mostly falls into two main categories with a little bleed over between them. And the first is pretty much edgy jokes. This is material that the writers probably would have called jokes for the parents. Gags that have a little innuendo, but kids won't pick up on. Yeah. One of the earliest examples... I mean, Dan Schneider's shows aren't the only shows that do this, right? A lot of car- cartoons in general that we watch do this stuff like even shows like Spongebob do stuff like this, right? Like, so, like, it's not something that only he did on his shows. It is ever-present in so much media, including Disney uh, Disney cartoons, right? So, yeah, it, it sucks, but that's just a thing that happens, right? Of this was on The Amanda Show, where Amanda Bynes played a character called Penelope Taint. And Taint is, of course, a reference to genitalia. A lot of the other jokes are kind of defined by the fact that it's really hard to see if they were done on purpose. Even in the Quiet On Set documentary, I think they bring up a few examples where you kind of go, eh. Yeah, like in the Quiet On Set documentary, some of them, um, so some of the shots that they brought up, they were referencing that they might have been examples of, uh, of cum shots, which is a, a weird and a wild, wacky statement to say about like, Kids getting squirted in the face, by the way. But like, yeah, like legitimately, it, 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 that's what they said. And I was like, okay, well, hold on a second. Um, and and it, it, you know, it's it's just like I feel like anyone getting any sort of goo thrown at their face is objectively funny. And I and I feel like most people that watch it would just think that that's funny, right? Like I don't think that a lot of people's minds immediately goes to, oh, that's a cum shot, right? If if if, if that's to be said, like, you know, like, I don't know. Am I, am I crazy in thinking that chat? They're trying to stretch it. Yeah. Like, again, there are things that Dan has done that are definitely bad. And, you know, the stuff that we discussed just a little bit earlier, a hundred percent bad. But then stuff like this, it's like, okay, well, I mean, that's not that bad. Right. You know, excuse me if I don't just go down a huge list of potential innuendo in these shows, because I have just become so allergic to this topic in the past few years. And the reason is so many examples people would bring up to you just aren't real. They're not real innuendo. It's just them not getting the joke or reading into the scene wrong or not going in with context. And I just have gotten so tired of those cases. I've also found that when it comes to stuff that is like 100% confirmed innuendo, no question about it, your mileage is going to vary about how much people care about that stuff because half the time you'll go through all this effort and you'll explain this like hidden sex joke and the person you're talking to will be like huh that's really funny but especially in like zoe 101 Mm -hmm. icarly and victorious there are a ton of like risque edgy jokes and the thing is i remember when i was a kid this was the reason i first kind of noticed that the dan schneider brand existed even if i didn't know what to call it I just remember that I used to watch Zoey 101 when I was really little, and I was just shocked by how often characters in those shows would, like, talk about their boobs, or they'd make jokes about puberty, or they'd just hang around in bikinis. And I thought it was so new and different and edgy and risque, and I thought it was cool. And then I grew up, and I went like, oh, those jokes are 
Those jokes are kind of weird. Like specifically, I think it's- All right, who's really at fault here though? Let's discuss for a second, guys. All right, cause like at the end of the day, right? We all watch these shows, but our parents let us watch these shows, right? So like, I, listen, I'm just saying people complain that millennials don't know how to be good parents, you know, by giving their kids iPads, which I agree with. My sister does the same thing to her child. I'm not trying to call her out. It's just truth. But at the same time, my parents let me watch these shows. So like, you know, <laughs> who's at fault right now? Strange to be working on a kid's show uh, with actual child stars and to write them specific jokes about their boobs and to have them deliver these jokes that were written about their boobs. I think that's a weird thing. And yet, yeah, that is a weird thing, actually, in hindsight, when you think about it, that like it's mostly male writers writing about teenage girls boobs does that does not sit i i said that sentence out loud i did not like saying that sentence out loud that's a very uncomfortable sentence to say out loud but yeah that's that's what happens right like i was allowed to watch because my siblings were watching them fair enough after i seen that one scene where Anna Grande was upside down mount open with water or what the hell being posted on her it made me say what the f yeah that scene that that's definitely one of the weirder scenes uh for sure i will say I, i'll admit i'll agree with you on that one i'll agree with you on that scene that that one scene that one's weird, but I'm guessing you saw that scene on Twitter. Did you watch that scene in full context? Nowadays, when I see people post about like their favorite Zoe 101 jokes, their favorite Victorious jokes, it's those jokes that get posted because a lot of people still love that stuff. The second category is the explicit sexualization of teen stars. And there's like no humor, there's no irony, there's not a bit, it's just sexualization and mm. that's it. I think you can definitely make the case that this became more of a thing in the 2010s when these shows started to have older cast members and they appealed to a bit of an older teen audience. That report by Business Insider claims that Nickelodeon and Schneider would have regular disputes about the outfits that were picked out for the cast members of Victorious. In one instance, a dispute surrounded- a It is literally a Victorious suit. I feel like Victorious like definitely made a lot of these jokes that were way more uncomfortable than any of the other shows, like by a large margin, for sure, right? Skirt that was being worn by a 17 year old Victoria Justice. Nickelodeon wanted it longer to be more appropriate, but Dan liked it just the length it was. Eventually they settled on a compromise of making it just three inches longer. A pretty common consensus was that at this point in his career, Schneider might have been a little frustrated about how he was still stuck in the realm of kids TV when he kind of wanted to make adult shows and Victorious was kind of a way for him to experiment and push that envelope. And that especially seems true when it came to the way that he sexualized the women on that show. I think one of the most obvious examples of this is the season one episode where they get stuck in the RV and they're just locked in this RV during a heat wave and they're just lounging around in, you know, bikinis, getting all sweaty and getting wet. And like I said at the time, it's a fan service episode. It is an episode for the people at home that wanted to look at that stuff. And it is very explicitly sexualization of the cast members on the show. And that's why I've always felt kind of awkward about this new culture where people are like nostalgically bragging about how Victorious was their sexual awakening. Yeah, yeah, again, all right, just saying, mine, Zoe 101, and Wizards of Waverly Place. Okay, like I feel like I had a very sexual awakening, just saying, right? Because those shows weren't very sexual. I mean, you might argue that Zoe 101 might have been a little bit more sexual, but like, you know, Wizards of Waverly Place kind of was that. So, like, I'm just saying, witnessing selena gomez at the time as a kid great stuff great stuff just then that's probably what they were going for and that's not good i don't like that obviously the crossover between sexualization and innuendo is kind of big and you know there's you just say mine was dexter's laboratory his mom had thighs for days i mean you're not wrong but what the hell bro a bunch of stuff that could fall into one or the other in the piece by Business Insider, Daniela Monet recalls a scene where she was asked to eat a pickle while putting on lip gloss. And it seemed very obvious to her at the time that this was sexual and not appropriate for a teen audience. So she contacted Nickelodeon and suggested they not air the scene. And she was overruled and the scene aired anyways. 
In Daniela's eyes, the show was mostly wholesome and funny, but the sexual moments did happen from time to time, and she personally blamed the male-dominated writer's room. She also made comments about how risque some of those outfits were and how they weren't appropriate for teenagers. Daniela wrapped up by saying, Do I wish certain things, like, didn't have to be so sexualized? Yeah, a hundred percent. Now, I think one of the most infamous examples of this is female characters having things sprayed in their faces. Gross! Trina? I'm not gonna yeah. I... <laughs> According to Alexa Nicholas, when a similar scene was filmed for Zoe 101, someone in the crew commented, ha ha, it's like a cum shot. Yeah. Now, the Zoe 101 thing, I will say again, I talked about it earlier. I didn't think that one was, you know, blatantly that, right? Like legitimately, it's like, it's just kind of funny, you know? <laughs> that's not, that's not my, where my brain was going. <laughs> if someone actually said that, or it's just kind of her memory representing the energy of the room, it doesn't matter because I think the intent is certainly there. Now, I think- I don't, I don't agree with that. I watched that and I was like, that's fine. That just seems funny to me. Right? The fucking... <laughs> okay, hold on. Final example I want to bring up of these inappropriate jokes are the various scenes in Victorious where we see adult characters interact with the teenagers and make some kind of comment about the age of consent. So, what's your name? I'm 16. Later. Yeah. Okay, this stuff here, the, like literally in Victorious, dude, the fact that like the, you have a team of writers that blatantly kept writing seems like, sorry, scenes? Scenes like this into shows that were about teenagers. Now that is more concerning to me as a person, right? Hey, are you in college yet? Bye. <laughs> This is a very common thing in those early seasons. The 17-year-old characters, played by 17-year-old actors, are constantly having adult characters, played by adult actors, comment on how yep. hot they are. Let me see this girl who, whoa, <laughs> that is quite... And it's at this point that I feel I must remind everyone of this especially weird clip from an extended DVD edit of an episode of no, Ray Carly. No, 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 not the, not the scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the stuff. <laughs> Rub it around. Oh, okay. <laughs> you like Italian food? Oh God, I want to stop. I want it to just end. I want it, my eyes. I want to just get my eyes just plucked out right now. And yeah, it's weird to name a character for a 13 year old after Taint. It's weird to write scenes for a kid show where someone shoots moisturizer into a woman's face. It's weird to put scenes in Victorious where you think Tori is gonna get assaulted by a group of guys. It's weird to put jokes in Zoe 101 about the actors going through puberty. It's weird to put jokes in Victorious where the teenage characters are so hot that the adult characters are keeping track of age of consent laws. It's very, very weird. And it might not be illegal, but it's wrong. I just want you, I just want you to look at my face right now. I, I'm, I'm just disgusted. I'm visibly disgusted right now. And I, I just, I don't, this stuff like wasn't really discussed too much in length when it came to the quiet on set documentary. I think a lot of that was about just the other world culture. I think it like, it definitely hard pivoted um, halfway through the documentary and focused more on the other adults that were allowed to work under Dan Schneider that like, you know, he may have personally employed or something like that, uh, who were actually out there, um, you know, assaulting children and stuff like that, which is really unfortunate. And when, when you put these two things together and you think about that work culture that Dan had, and then you go ahead and you think about the, the people that he had working there. And then you you think about the freaking jokes and stuff, jokes, I should say, that were written about these children. It just really makes you think, right? Like, like are, are more of these people secretly, like, horrible? Um, 
which I, I, I wouldn't say that maybe they are, but like it, it, it is, it's really, really strange for like, for sure, for hundred percent sure. All right. It's almost as though he's enabling him. It definitely seemed like he was enabling him, but like, I, I don't want to say that he was, I want to say it's more so of like, you know, it seemed like he's a guy that really just cared about the money at the end of the day. And maybe he allowed it to happen because it was making him money. Right. Like if, if that makes a little bit more sense, like it just makes sense that he was making so much revenue from all these shows and all these things and all these jokes and bits and whatever that they allowed to happen, uh, that he just kept doing it. You know, yeah. Turning a blind eye is a better way of putting it for sure. <laughs> and now that we're broaching this topic of allegedly sexual moments in the material of Dan Schneider. Let's talk about the B-plot from Victoria, Season 1, Episode 12, Cat's New Boyfriend. So in the story, Robbie is hanging out with the gang when he notices Trina is surrounded by several shruggers, who worship and rub her feet in total awe. Yeah, yeah, again, we, uh, there's not really much we can say about the feet stuff. The feet stuff is definitely weird. It's definitely weird. It's absolutely weird. It's the strangest, 100%, but yeah. Robbie asks what's up, and Trina reveals that she now has an extremely smooth foot. Robbie asks what her secret is, and she responds, fish. At the Vega household, we see Trina filling up a tank with imported puka fish. She reveals that they feed off of dead skin cells, meaning they perfectly clean the human foot of all waste. Robbie puts his feet in, and soon enough, is getting this special treatment himself. Oh. Oh. Wow. Soon, Andre is recruited into the practice, followed by Jade and Beck. Towards the end of the episode, Kat punches Tori in the face, leading them to go to the local hospital. There, they find all of their friends suffering from severe poisoning, which is the side effect of the puka fish. But feel our feet. <laughs> yes, I realize that they can nibble away all uh, of the... Nurses, feel these kids' feet. <laughs> I, I would, I, uh, it, do, it doesn't get easier. It, it really does not get easier to like watch that scene, right? Like that, that's, that is just abhorrently weird. That is just weird. Everyone. <laughs> Something is afoot. That's, that's good. <laughs> So this is kind of a third tier of the allegations made against the content produced by Dan Schneider. There is innuendo, sexualization, and then alleged fetish content. The main problem with this conversation is that this topic has been the source of so much humor that it is hard to engage with this without it seeming like a big joke. Yeah. But if you look at it in the worst way possible, which most do, it's not really funny at all because it's child exploitation, yep. allegedly. Rule one. There's also a huge level of ambiguity with this material, which I think is the main reason it was primarily left out of the Quiet On Set documentary. But this has been a primary focus of my research ever since I started this mess. So when I was watching iCarly, I wanted to find some way to represent how overpresent this issue is in Dan Schneider's material. And so I actually kept a tally so I could come up with an with a number that I could then cite for this segment. And after all my research, oh, this is the number. Oh god. I'm scared. 28 there are 28 episodes of iCarly that do not feature some kind of weird foot thing. Wait, I'm sorry. Pause. There are 28 that do not, meaning all the rest do. Oh, it just gets worse. And to be completely transparent, the reason that number is so ridiculous is that for several seasons of the show, the feet moments would be edited into the opening sequence so every time you start watching an episode there it fucking is right there looping every single time 
But if we decide that doesn't count, which is entirely valid, then okay. the numbers play okay. out like this. All right, this. hold on, hold on. There are 97 episodes of iCarly. Okay. About 46 of those episodes have some kind of foot reference or foot joke or foot footage. That's like, that's like almost half still, right? That's still, that's still very bad. That is still like damning in, in a lot of regards. And yikes. Characters get their feet massaged. Some get massaged with feet. Foot surgery is commonly name dropped. Oh, I forgot he's having that foot surgery on Friday. Real world kids show their feet in. F dude, that. Okay, I'm not going to show this for too long in the frame. But like, dude, there was a tweet that resurfaced, I believe, from iCarly, where they would ask children to post pictures of their feet on social media so that the official page can go ahead and retweet it. Like, that is definitely something that is just, when you look back at that, that's strange. That is very, very strange. And it makes me as an adult highly uncomfortable. That is a real tweet. I, I, I'm not going to go looking and, and pull it up right now. But it is a 100% real tweet because I did pull it up the other day because it was still on Twitter. But it, it, it was actually real. So, yeah, like, it, 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 it just blows my mind. I still have it up. Do you actually still, can you, can you like send it to, I just want to show this week, but yeah, like legit, it's just, it's just absolutely unfortunate that this, this is just something that they, that they absolutely just let happen, right? Like, and, and you have to question, right? Like as, as executives of the show or whatever, like you're running this company, how do you go ahead and continue to allow this to happen per se? But then also like, you know, again, parents, par parents at the time, why did our parents let us consume this media? Did they not understand? To be fair, they probably didn't. But like, still, like, it, it, it's just, it's just odd, dude. It's just odd. Fan videos that are often featured. There's even a character named Sako who you could very easily claim is just one extended foot joke. Feet okay. are so. Hold as on, pause. Those socks, though. Those socks are actually kind of cool. I'm not gonna lie. Like, those socks are legit. Like, kind of dope. The glowing socks. Here, I'm pull up the tweet right now just to show you guys. It is still a real tweet. On Twitter, there it is, Salmon Cat tomorrow, right on the bottom of your foot, take a picture and use Salmon Cat and we'll tweet, retweet and follow it, right? This tweet resurfaced recently, but yes, it's from 2013. This is a real tweet. Now it, it's been ratioed because people are finally looking back at it and thinking, oh my God, this is a little strange. But back then, yeah, like this, this is just real. This is really what happened in 2013. And we as a society kind of just let it happen. That, that's a little crazy. Back to the video. Essential to the iCarly brand that in the episode where the Dingo channel rips them off, there is a foot reference on their pin board of ideas to steal. And in I Go to Japan, the Japanese equivalent of iCarly has an obsession with gigantic hands. Now there are two different perspectives to take on this topic, and I feel it is my duty to present both of these, mm -hmm. partially because despite these being contradictory seeming, you know, perspectives, I kind of believe both of these to some extent. It is difficult to talk about depictions of feet in children's media without first addressing the fact that we are in an unprecedented era of the average person on the planet being exposed to fetish culture on a daily basis against their will. I'm being completely serious about this. Think about this for a second. If you were suddenly, magically, in 1991, and you had the brain of someone from 1991, your average understanding of fetishes that you don't have, that you're not into, it would go way down. And I'm not trying to be sex negative. All I'm saying is that if you were a creative person in the 90s, it's entirely possible that you might think that like fart jokes are really edgy and funny and you might write skits where you work in a bunch of fart jokes and then boom, 30 years later, people are accusing you of having a fart fetish and you're like, I didn't know that was a thing back then. But now okay. there's this huge... That's an interesting perspective to have actually now that I think about that. that, that is That is an interesting perspective. I don't know if I agree with it though, but like... He, he has a point, right? Sensitivity people have to any kind of media they see that might have a fetish if you look at it sideways, 
Like, oh, Junior with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's M-Preg. The start to Harry Potter 3, that's inflation. Pac-Man, that's Vor. And to give you a specific example of what I'm talking about, I think about a year ago, a SpongeBob clip went viral because it had a foot in it. And people were saying, oh, this is disgusting. This is a foot fetish being hidden in children's programming. And when you watched it, it was very obviously just gross out humor written and made by someone who thinks that feet are kind of funny. I don't personally believe that every foot joke is a fetish thing. And that's especially true when you remember that the old Nickelodeon brand was a kind foot. of the gross yeah. out like humor that the other networks wouldn't do, you know, making jokes about farts and boogers and yes, feet. And, and I mean, more importantly, they'd cover you with slime, right? Which is like, I, I feel like at this point, like, you know, slime is still slime, but I, you know, given the point that he has right now, I would argue that he might be right that a few years from now, some people might start seeing the slime thing as weird. When, it, when it's just slime, you know? Feet are gross, it's shock humor, it's supposed to be for little 12 year old kids who think that stuff is funny. And mm. so even when it comes to iCarly, I think when I look at moments Hi, like this. I'm not here for your entertainment, <laughs> I'm a foot, leave me alone. <laughs> oh, foot. I can see you looking at that clip and saying, well, that's just shock humor, that's just. That's actually just funny, I, I have to give it just funny. Like that is genuinely just funny just supposed to be funny. That's not a fetish thing at all. And so going into this segment, I think it's natural to kind of assign a hesitant, plausible deniability to all of this. Because sure, putting feet references and feet jokes and feet moments in almost half of the episodes of iCarly that's weird. Yeah. But an onlooker could easily say, oh yeah, that's weird, but the writers just thought it was funny. They were weird guys, you know, it's not necessarily a malicious action by itself. And I think that is arguably totally fair until we get to Sam and Cat. Yeah. Because no, they yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. I will agree with that because I think in Sam and Cat, it definitely reached a new level that was absolutely, uh, you know, disgusting and like definitely like, okay, you know, maybe... Maybe at first it was like a joke and now it's like you're actually feeding into it because like, I, I don't know, you're maybe you're into it now or something, right? Like it's, it's just weird. People are really going around TikTok about the slime being able to be green screen, a different color. What? What does that even mean? There is a tweet that was put out by the official Sam and Cat Twitter, which is for some reason still up to oh, this is, very day. Is he day. about to talk about the tweet and that we I just found? I kind of view this wait, tweet as the smoking wait. gun. And yep. sometimes I think yep. okay, hold on. that Where's no the one would have reassessed Where's this tweet? part of Dan Schneider's it's content it's still there. if it wasn't it's for still, this I still have the tweet up. It's real. I can like this tweet right now. I, 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 oh my God, I don't want to. Okay. Sam and Cat tomorrow, yep. Yep. right still on up. the bottom of your foot. Yep. Yep. Take a pic. Yep. and use hashtag Sam and Cat Saturday will retweet yep. and follow until our fingers get sore. And that is still a real tweet. Again, I can pull it up. It is still on Twitter. This is the official Sam and Cat account that you can still follow. I'm not making this website up. I'm not going to scroll because there are actual kids there that posted their feed and I don't want to expose them or whatever. But like, yeah, like this, this is the, the thing that like, you know, you could say is like the irrefutable evidence that at this point that whatever they were doing is beyond weird and it's just screwed up right so an appeal briefly to rule one i don't want to get sued so there's things i want to say about that tweet that i'm not going to allegedly that they were weird i should add because i also don't want to get sued actually i just want to make that clear i don't have a lot of money i'm in medical debt but what i will say with extreme precaution is that when you have been accused of putting feet fetish material into the children's programming that you make, it is extremely bad optics. When someone logs into the social media account of yep. the show you run yep. and solicits children for photos of the bottom of their feet, yep and then promises to follow back yep. anyone who follows these instructions. Yeah. And of course, I have to point out that Schneider is very infamous 
for putting out tweets on his personal account about the feet of his child stars. Pick! Carly tickles Sam's very unusual toes. Wait, if you what, have a what? moment, will you please name what? Sam's toes for us? What? What? I didn't know about this part at all. What? Video! Would you like to see Victoria Justice pour ketchup all over her feet? Oh! Well, here you go! Oh, the God. toe, recently adorned with a special toe flower, belongs to the sweet and hilariously talented Miss Jeanette McCurdy. All right, guys, we're going to take a breather. We're going to take a moment. I cannot right now. I'm going to be back. Everybody watching on YouTube, you won't see a break happen here. But for people on Twitch, it's happening. We're going we're gonna to be back. I'm back, and I arguably still feel like I want to throw up, like, genuinely. Like, like literally. This is, this is like, trauma-inducing, right? Like I, like, I feel like we are, we are in the ninth circle of hell watching this i wanted to go ahead and find my rosary like i like i had a rosary that my mom gave me because she was like you have to pray every day and stuff like that and i and i i tried to find it just now right like i don't know i don't even think i believe in god anymore i'm gonna be honest with you but like in that moment of desperation you know how they say like people in their moment of desperations they try to pray or or, or, or look for some god for reprieve that's that's what happened to me just now right I do think we need Jesus to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I looked, I searched, I couldn't find it. Um, I'm a little, un, a little, a little sad about that, but, um, yeah, we, st we still have like 40 more minutes of this video to, to go through and I, I die. Yikes. Just yikes. Okay. Let's continue. All right. At one point he even mentions feet while flirting with his wife at hungry girl. Do you want to go for a drive? Do you want to go into our room and watch Too Cute? We have four on our DVR. I'll rub your feet. What the fuck is Too Cute? This man is not beating the allegations, dog. Oh my God. It's just a, a show where they show puppies and kittens? That's what we need right now. This is what they would watch? They just put on a show that's just cute animals? Jesus. I don't know what to feel about that. And as someone who's really studied this material, I truly think that it resembles fetish content in a major way that is hard to deny. And it's not just the presence of feet. It's the focus on shots of the bottom of the foot, of kids using their feet yeah. to do tasks, videos of kids ah! sticking their feet in their mouths. The, oh God, why did I pause it there? Mouths or in their noses and having ketchup and slime and whatever poured onto the bottom of their feet. And the important thing is that if we do read this as fetish content, it's even worse than what we've seen so far. Because the thing about sexualizing teenagers on network television is that it was often done to appeal to the young kids watching who were going through puberty. And it wasn't a Nickelodeon exclusive thing. It wasn't good. Yeah. But no, it wasn't something that, that Nickelodeon invented. Yeah, no, again, I, I, I did say that earlier. I think at the same time that this was happening, a lot of the other networks are doing the exact same thing. And we do have to acknowledge that. But the thing about feet fetishes is that they are not typically something you imagine as being on the wavelength of the average kid, and especially not the average kid back when these shows were on the air. And if this is all a misunderstanding, if this is all just rumors and people making up claims and people not understanding these scenes, it is again, very bad optics that there is a character in Victorious who seems to personify all of the worst allegations against Dan Schneider. Before he even gets into that though, I think that like it's already bad enough that the tweets exist, right? Like I feel like the tweets are just bad enough. And 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 like that that is the part for me that like I it it, it just bothers me. It, it bothers me a lot, you know? Uh Universe, my uh my friend and manager, he's going to be here tomorrow. I need a hug. I really do feel a hug. At the time of this recording, he's on his way to fly over here and um yeah, I feel like right now would be a good time to get a hug from another human being because hearing all of this is... <laughs> you know, maybe I should just go. Very well. But first, I'd like a foot massage. What? No, I'm not giving you a foot massage. I have embarrassing photos of you. What? What, what? what kind of embarrassing photos? They were taken from unflattering angles during your awkward phase. Well, where are they? 
You'll see when I post them on my blog. No, why, why would you do that? Because you refuse to give me a foot massage. You threaten a teenager. You threaten to blackmail a teenager with unflattering photos of her if you don't give her, if she doesn't give you a foot massage. Like, just the context alone is awful, if you think about it. But I don't see why... <sighs> oh, yeah, Christopher Kane has an obsession with feet, and he asks women on the Victoria set to give him massages, and he threatens people if he doesn't get what he wants, and he embarrasses people on his public blogs. But those are just like jokes, man. Don't don't read too far into any of that. The thing is that due to my due diligence, I took a lot of notes about this topic, and I have a lot of weird clips it's a, I could show, it's a little specific strange. examples of this, that kind of thing. But at some point, I get worried that people will think that it's funny or that I will literally be uploading, like, from some, some vantage point, just a compilation of child exploitation. So I, I don't think there's a lot more I could say about the feet thing. I guess one of the final things I have to say is that there are truly some days where I think about this and I look at some of these clips and I'm not totally completely sure that Dan Schneider does have a foot fetish because I think I think it could be possible that he's just this really eccentric guy who just really thinks feet are the funniest thing on the planet in such an over exaggerated way that it just comes across weird to modern audiences but when I was watching the show I thought this stuff was easily the most disturbing material I came across. And I think that most days I find it impossible to believe that this stuff is 100% innocent. I don't know. I, the, for me, it's the tweets. Like it, it's, it's just the tweets. The tweet that like the tweets are bad. They definitely seem bad. I probably flip flop my opinion like 12 times watching this video so far. Um, but like, I, I, I think overall, I, I, I started by saying like, I don't think that the feet are the most important thing. I still don't, I really don't. I think that like his treatment for people on sets and stuff like that, screaming at a teenager, definitely not good. The foot stuff is weird. It definitely is weird. It, it made me have a very important reaction just now. I'm not gonna lie, but like it, uh, I don't know. Does the man have a foot fetish? Is it bad? Is it inherently awful to have a foot fetish? Not really, but like imposing it on children, definitely is something that we should discuss as being something that is a little strange for the most part. I think, I think this shit shouldn't have been made. I think this shit is very bad. And I guess that's the short of it. Part four, bad actors on set. Oh no, he's actually touching this topic. So this is the part um, for me, where when I watched the actual documentary Quiet on Set, I specifically with friends, like we had to have a stopping moment where we were just like, okay, yeah, this is like, this is too much, right? Because just one of the actions of one person in particular and the stuff that they said that they had done to another kid, like an actual child on the set, it, I, I, I just could not. I just could not handle it. I could not deal with it. And it was a little too much. So, you know. Watch your own risk. Obviously, I'm trying to give you a trigger warning here um, because if he's going to touch the topic and the part that I think he will, it can be strange. Not only strange, just like too much. So when we're talking about the general work environment of some of these shows and not just the actions of one man, there are a couple other people that we need to briefly talk about. Starting off with the two least severe and probably most obscure. We know now that Sam and Cat was allegedly canceled on paper because of a sexual harassment allegation against one of the producers. We're pretty sure this wasn't Dan Schneider, but we don't know a lot of details outside of that. Secondly, we know that a writer on iCarly in his 30s started dating Jeanette McCurdy almost directly after she turned 18. But the most infamous problems came during the early years of Schneider's work, during the production of All That and its spin-off, The Amanda Show. So Jason Handy was a production assistant on these shows and one of- Which is one of the- funniest things to me i don't i don't want to like you know take away from the situation but his name is handy and what he does 
It, it was it was ironic. Okay, like that's the best way to put it. It was just ironic. One of his main jobs was he would hang out with the kids and he would help them get from place to place, kind of take them around the set. Jason was known to be very friendly with all the kids on set. He supposedly had very positive energy and no one really suspected him of anything. But in private, Jason Handy was a self-described pedophile. Jason would use- That is the, again, he literally described himself. Okay, this is not something that other people said about them he had a journal that he would document this this is this is in the uh, quiet unset documentary by the way which is the only reason i'm saying it out loud right now but in the quiet unset documentary they showed he had a journal where he himself called himself a pedophile and blatantly admitted that he liked children and he didn't understand why but he wanted to keep pursuing that thought process that he had in in liking children in that way it, it is it is so disturbing and and quite frankly very fucked up that that he was allowed to work on sets with these children in close proximity he was in charge essentially of making sure that they were okay what was the vetting process like putting a man like this on set in in the vicinity of children right and 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 and, and that that is 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 what like made me and my friend we gotta stop this is the first moment that made us stop by the way there was a second moment that made us stop. Use his position on several shows, including those at Nickelodeon, to establish a form of contact with children and then attempt to isolate the children from their parents. And he would specifically not go after the main stars of the shows, but the kind of more obscure kids coming in to do guest performances mm -hmm, for one episode, mm -hmm. to, to stand in the back of a room as extras. He went after the kids who wanted to make it big and were looking for connections, looking for people who knew how to get them a successful career, and he took advantage of that. So he would start emailing them, texting them, writing them letters, and then he'd kind of get them out of the view of their parents, and then things would get sexual. When he was finally caught by the police, they searched his house and they found plastic bags, and each plastic baggie was filled with letters from children and some kind of personal objects he had obtained, including, you know. He basically acted like a serial killer because we've we've seen oh time and time again that serial killers will do this. They'll take like trophies essentially, right, from their victims or, or whatever, and which is disturbing enough. He would do this with children who essentially obviously were his victims. What Quentin isn't touching here, and I'm not sure if he's gonna touch this part at all, was there is an instance that the documentary um, touches on where this guy um essentially a parent allowed him to go ahead and email back and forth um their daughter or whatever and at first it came off as innocent and you know he was just being playful and whatever but eventually one day he was telling this like fucking 10 or 13 year old gold girl sorry that he really missed her and he sends her a dick pic his dick pic and she screams and runs to her bedroom and the mom is like, what, like, what's going on? What's going on? And, and, she, and she goes over the computer and she sees that, right? Like, this man, this man is an absolute fucking horrible being. And, and, and I, it's just, it, it, it just grossed me out. So Little things he'd been sent in the mail and even things like underwear. And so as soon as this was found out, he was obviously removed from all these shows and he was put on trial. He had assaulted children, he had kept up illicit conversations with children, and we're talking about kids as young as six years old. The second person we need to speak of here is Brian Peck. Brian was primarily a child dialogue one. coach who had worked on several Nickelodeon shows. He had been in the industry for decades and had established connections with many young actors who are today quite famous. During the production of The Amanda Show, Brian Peck became interested in a teenage boy named Drake Bell. Drake at the time was- Yep, yep, it, it gets worse, all right? You guys know who Drake Bell is. The reveal for this one in the documentary was really, really cool. Because uh, he's about to probably re-explain everything that I'm saying right now. But, like, before we get into that, I want to explain how the documentary uh, brought it up to you. So the documentary talked about how there was an instance where Brian Peck got really close to an actor on the set. Brian Peck would, um, you know, hang out with this actor, do a lot of cool things with this actor. And then eventually things got weird with this actor. And um, eventually Brian Peck assaulted this actor. They had the actual criminal report uh, that was on Brian Peck. And Brian, it, it said 
that Brian Peck inserted foreign objects that were not part of his body into this actor. And it's like, yeah, he, he sexually assaulted this actor. It's really disturbing when you think about it. And like, they, they were like, okay, well, like, you know, when the, I guess the detectives or whoever it was came in to the set one day and they were like, okay, well, did Brian assault any of you guys? And all the kids looked around the room and they were like, oh, no, no, he didn't. And then they, they were like, well, well, who did, who did Brian Peck assault? And, the, you know, even, even the people who were doing the documentary, they're like, yeah, like we, to this day, we don't know who Brian Peck assaulted. We just heard that he assaulted one of the kids and we still have no clue. And, you know, eventually the, the camera, uh, it, like, it cuts or whatever. And then Drake Bell walks in. That is how the episode ends. Brian Peck, the person that he assaulted, the kid that he has assaulted was uh, not Drake Be uh, Peck, uh, Drake Bell. He assaulted Drake Bell, which is really freaking disgusting. And I know that there's some people out here saying, all right, hey, we shouldn't be defending Jake, uh, Drake Bell. He obviously did something maybe somewhat similar because he was talking to like a 16 year old and stuff like that, allegedly or whatever. Um, but still like he himself got assaulted that is still a bad thing right like that that's awful at the end of the day like what he did is equally awful but like he was still a victim at one point and that sucks being managed by his father who initially did not take any concern at the presence of brian until he saw drake and brian get closer and closer and Brian started to act inappropriately and he started to get concerned. He went around on set and tried to ask around about Brian and talk about how he felt kind of uncomfortable with how touchy-feely he was and how close he seemed to be to Drake and all these things. But pretty much everyone on set told him that he was being ridiculous. Everyone knew Brian, he was gay, so people thought he was maybe being homophobic. And in fact, Brian Peck was such a popular person on set that he even had a cameo character on The Amanda Show named Pickle Boy, who was a character that would go around with a big tray of pickles, kind of bragging about how much he loves touching and feeling pickles. Drake's parents were divorced, and eventually Brian was able to manipulate not just Drake, but Drake's mother into fully cutting Drake's father out of his life. From then on out, Brian would essentially become Drake's new manager, taking him around to auditions and having him sleep over at Brian's house. This was until one day, when for the first time, Brian Peck sexually assaulted Drake Bell. Afterwards, Drake was overcome with guilt and embarrassment and shame, and he felt he couldn't tell anyone. And he also couldn't remove Brian from his life because that might tip off people that this thing had happened. And yeah. so the status quo continued, and Drake was continuously raped and abused by Brian Peck, until Drake finally broke down and told his mother the truth. Soon, the law came down on Brian for his repeated sexual abuse of a minor. Brian Peck's abuse did hit the news, but Bell was kept anonymous, and yep. very few people in his circle knew what had happened. One exception to this was... Dan and the crazy part is, even though this had happened to him, he kept going with the show. And, and it just brings you different context when you look back at uh, the show Drake and Josh that he was dealing with this in the background and he kept going with the show, right? Like that, that, that sucks. That really does suck. Dan Schneider, who immediately became guilty that this had been allowed to happen on one of his sets. He told Drake that he didn't need to talk about it if he didn't want to, but that Dan was willing to be there for him if he ever needed anything. At Brian Peck's trial, countless crew members and celebrities wrote letters in support of Brian Peck, many insinuating that the only way this could have happened was if Drake Bell seduced Brian. Some even arrived in person to give statements. Yeah, that was another thing. There's a lot of famous actors. You know, the one actor um, who was in the Sonic live action movies, he was one of the actors that wrote a letter and I believe was also on set saying that they believe that Brian Peck uh, is innocent. Like they wrote a letter to the court and they were like, yeah, Drake Bell probably had to have seduced him or something. There is no way that Brian was this awful. Like, like they essentially victim blame, which as we know as a modern society is not a good thing. Yes, it is absolutely disgusting. It is one of the worst things that could have come out of it. In support of Brian and against Drake Bell. Dan Schneider was one of the few prominent people in the industry that stood by Drake Bell and helped him and his mother in their court case. After the trial, Brian Peck mm -hmm. served only 16 months in jail. After being released, he registered as a sex offender and then was almost immediately hired to work 
on the Zach Disney Channel Cody. series, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Fun I, 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 wanna, I want you guys to listen to that, right? This man was obviously registered as a sex offender. He obviously did this really bad thing. He only spent 16 months in prison. A lot of Hollywood tried to back him up. Dan Schneider was one of the few people that didn't, right? Like, so as much as we paint Dan Schneider as this really awful guy, which he is, he definitely still is for a lot of those other things, we can't really say that the man's a pedophile, right? Like, the man definitely is into some weird feet stuff, yells at children. Sure, he's awful to his female coworkers. That stuff is still very awful. But the people that are labeling him as a pedophile, he's not. Dan Schneider is definitely not. But the people that worked around him, people like fucking uh, Brian Peck, 100% were. And he got away with it, which is the worst part. The man went to prison for 16 months, was registered as a sex offender, and then still got hired by Disney to work on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And that is awful. That is the state of the world that we live in. And that, like in the entertainment industry, it doesn't matter how awful you are. Sometimes there, you will just be protected and you will still get a job and it sucks. Finding ultimate judgment for who is to blame in cases like this can be hard. I do not think that Dan Schneider is responsible in any major way for what happened to Drake Bell. Brian Peck was hired by Tall and Robbins Productions, Dan Schneider had no role in the hiring process, and Brian Robbins was not a registered sex offender when he was hired to work on these shows. Mm -hmm. But I think it again speaks to this idea that when you're in a situation where you are in charge of a group of kids, there are certain unique responsibilities that should be expected of you, which you would not have on a regular production. And one of those things is being able to recognize those red flags of potential abuse. If you're going after women in your writer's room because they harsh the vibe or because you think they're reporting you to the Writers Guild of America, then I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation that you're kind of paying attention to what the men on your set are getting up to and kind of how they're acting and how they're interacting with some of these kids. But I do also think that if it were a teacher or a principal or a counselor who had missed some of these red flags, I would not give them a lifetime judgment for that mistake. But what these stories certainly represent is that all of this matches very closely with that classic Nickelodeon standard of move fast, break things, and apologize 20 years later. There are two yep. other things I wanna talk about really quickly on this subject. The yeah. first is that- Every episode of the documentary ends with Nickelodeon saying that they did an internal investigation, blah, 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 and they couldn't really find that much wrong. Like that, that was like how like, I, I think like every episode ended, which is like, that's just, I don't think true, right? Like it, it, I feel like it just can't be, you know? I've had a lot of people try to pitch to me ways where you could read Dan Schneider's actions in this situation as like secretly malicious, like it was an example of his misogyny or his special treatment of his special stars. But the thing is, I think it's kind of a strange ordeal to want to believe that every single action Dan ever made yeah. in his entire life was secretly evil because i think the narrative you spin when you go down that path is that if dan schneider ever did anything good or nice or justifiable that forgives the other stuff and it absolutely doesn't just because dan schneider did the right thing in the drake bell case doesn't mean he doesn't deserve any criticism no, absolutely. for all the other stuff we've talked about in this video mm -hmm. and the other thing i want to talk about is that it is so very obvious to me that the quiet on set documentary by investigation discovery absolutely lets drake bell off the hook when it comes yep. to his own mis yeah so that's the other thing like the 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 quiet on set documentary made it seem as though drake bell definitely didn't like do anything wrong I mean, they mention it. They definitely mention it. They mention it at the end where they're like, yeah, Drake Bell was also sentenced, um, you know, doing explicit acts with like a minor or something like that. Right. And that's that's as much as they go into it. Right. They don't go any further into it. Right. And, and, and no, that's not OK. He still did something wrong. But yes, I agree. He is also still a victim. Conduct with minors. The cycle of abuse is a real thing and it is tragic in a big way. But when Drake Bell was sexting 15 year olds, he was in his damn 30s, mm -hmm. okay? So he is absolutely responsible for his actions. And I think it's a little too soon 
when he's when he goes to trial and is sentenced what three years ago that now everybody magically thinks that that didn't happen and the reason that the quiet on set documentary doesn't really go down that path or look at that angle is ironically the same bias that i think affects how a lot of the people that worked with dan schneider kind of look at this stuff which is that basically if drake bell hadn't worked with the quiet on set documentary crew the documentary probably would not have had any legitimacy i think that's just the answer that's the obvious obvious answer People would not have watched it. People would not have believed it. People heard that Drake Bell was a part of it, and they wanted to hear what he had to say on Dan Schneider, which he really didn't have anything bad to say about Dan Schneider. He just had something bad to say about his experience um, with uh, Brian Peck, right? But still, that is, that is, I think, legitimately why they probably only pursued the angle of making uh, Drake look uh, a little better in his case because, you know, yeah, he's getting them the views that they need for this documentary to be successful. They wouldn't have a finished documentary. I think the first uh, the first episode of that documentary and even parts of the final episode are so very clearly stitched together and like missing stuff. And if they didn't have the Drake Bell interviews, it would be an absolute mess of a documentary. So they don't want to criticize Drake Bell for his own actions. And I think that's the same reason a lot of people in the industry privately don't have a problem with Dan Schneider. It's because... You know, despite the rough times, mm -hmm. they owe him something. Yep. You know, he's yep. and that brings me back to what I said about two hours ago when this started was that, um, yeah, like it, that is just how the industry is, right? Like a lot of us just put up with it because we're like, well, you know, we wouldn't have a career without it, right? It sucks. It, it is horrible. There are a lot of horrible people out there that, as creators, we put up with all the damn time, and it does suck. And I'm again, I don't want you guys to speculate and pinpoint and try to pinpoint who these people are. Uh, just, just don't harass anyone, uh, and, and, and don't try to find out on your own or whatever the case. But like, yeah, I'm aware of me even saying this will probably just cause some people to like still go out of their way to try to investigate. But like, yeah, they're, they're awful people out there. Um, and you know, in, in every facet, face cam streamers, VTubers, whatever the case, they suck. <laughs> it's responsible for something they have in their lives, whether that's a good writing job or just the happy memories or being able to watch these old shows. And, you know, it's just ironic to me that that same bias of not wanting to go after this guy that, that you feel like you kind of owe to some extent is very clearly present in the Quiet and Onset documentary. Because I fully believe that not only does Drake Bell deserve to be criticized for what he got caught doing, not even what he did, what he got caught doing. Not only does he deserve to be criticized for that, in some cases he deserves to be made fun of it, and I don't regret making jokes about it, because this is a man in his 30s sexting 15-year-olds. It's not something you just sweep under the rug with a 30-second quote. To quickly yeah, get his cut back up disgusting. to the present, in 2014, Dan Schneider was allegedly investigated for allegations of the onset atmosphere on the show Sam and Cat. Because of Nickelodeon's findings and overall hesitancy about him, he was allegedly forced to no longer interact with his stars, now directing the series from a booth outside of the set and having people rush his orders back and forth between takes. This took the hours of filming on Sam and Cat from around 13 hours to more like 17 hours, and that's in a single day of filming. Yep. When Sam and Cat ended, several of the leads on the show were allegedly offered payouts if they agreed to never speak about, in specifics, the on-set atmosphere on that show. After 2014, photos of Schneider's on-set working on these shows are either extremely rare or non-existent. In 2018, rumors and allegations of Schneider committing sexual misconduct against his stars alongside complaints of people on set triggered another investigation. No evidence was found of the alleged sexual misconduct with his stars, but evidence of emotional abuse was found. Yep. After this, Schneider and the network went their separate ways and he has never worked on television since. It is just- He did go ahead and have that interview though, I think recently where uh, it was just to save face to be honest, where he, I think it was one of the previous stars that was on one of the shows that he did now works for a news network and they had that person interview him and essentially dan was just very apologetic saying like oh i'm very sorry that i did those things years ago and, and and what have you but it's like dude like you you were told time and time again 
at those times like by some people like hey this is not okay the network told you this is not okay right and like you still did it you still did it and that that's like are you really sorry at that point like i, I don't know generally accepted that schneider's yeah. current contract was broken Keep by the network the during this exchange yeah. and he walked around with a final payout of about seven million dollars i and that's the thing like the fact that all of this happened and he still gets a payout of seven million dollars you know how crazy that is this man literally never has to work for the rest of his life he is forever financially okay him not working for the past few years in the industry does not affect him whatsoever because he is good know for a fact that there's going to be people that misunderstand certain parts of this video and i'm even anticipating that there's going to be certain parts that are going to be clipped and taken out of context and posted on social media by really upset people so i feel i have to be absolutely direct and clear about this i think a lot of videos about dan schneider set out with the goal of proving that schneider did stuff that was bad enough that he should be in prison right now yep. and forever. I've always felt this is kind of a really steep hill to try and climb, which probably affects how a lot of people cover certain bits of information. So for me, my only goal over the last three years has been to try and prove that not only was it justified to fire Dan Schneider in 2018, he arguably should have been fired far before then and at this point unless i mean i feel like a lot of people agree with that sentiment right like he definitely I, I think should have been fired like a lot like a lot sooner than that but yeah no it's unfortunate that the network took as long as it did but you know looking at it from the network's uh standpoint he was their money maker he was making the shows that you know allowed nickelodeon to be quite honest survive uh as a network right in the age of television where like the other networks were like producing like banger after banger like stuff like disney was was just outputting like all these other shows nickelodeon was you know often seen as like the fan favorite because of dan schneider right unless hell freezes over or the daily wire has a really stupid idea dan schneider will never work in television again i think this is for the best Dan Schneider needs to go back to working in television like Drake Bell needs to go back to touring high schools around the country with his band. Part 5. Yikes. Why this all Yikes. matters. When I first started rewatching iCarly all those years ago for this series, one of the first takes that I came up with was so immediately controversial with everyone around me that I knew I had to hold on to it until this video so here it is this is my take i think that spencer shea is a dan schneider stand-in huh when i first told this okay wait a minute what what whoa 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 that is just uh, uh i don't even know how to process this right now is spencer from iCarly is a stand-in for dan schneider is he assuming that he he wrote let him talk okay you know what fine chat fine fine i know this is a crazy thing for me though this theory to people in my circle i okay, got immediate okay. backlash and the reason is simple spencer is everyone's brother he's the coolest possible materialization of what a father figure should be okay. how dare you insinuate that he has anything to do with dan schneider but of course he has something to do with dan schneider he was created by dan schneider he is dan schneider think about it who okay. is spencer well he's an artist he's a creative but he's rejected from the circles of other adult creatives and so with whom does he okay. bide his time well Kids. With the young creatives, the little kids who are so serious about their craft that they have decided that they are essentially the honorary adults in the room. And so Spencer has decided that he is fine with becoming the honorary cool kid. And so he spends all of his time fraternizing with the honorary adults and he 
comforts them and he tells them, hey, you're like me and I'm like you. And when you look at I really can't argue his logic right now. I, I'm looking I'm looking for reasons and ways to argue his logic. But when I look back at what I said at the start, how Dan's uh, past echoed in his work, I didn't really expect that Dan's past would also echo in the character of Spencer that he created. It, it does fit. It does fit. At these scenes, sometimes it doesn't seem like things are okay. Sometimes these kids are in explicit danger because of Spencer's impulsivity. And other times, there's not really any evidence that anything super bad is happening. But does that really make it all okay? And when you watch scenes like this... I know you have a crush on me. What? Nothing. We can easily rationalize that uh, technically Spencer hasn't done anything illegal in that situation. Uh, but shouldn't we expect him to be better anyways? Another example I came yeah. up with on a much more minor scale is Helen from Drake and Josh. In one of Helen's most memorable episodes, it turns out that when she was younger, she was the star of a sitcom for teenagers, and she forces some of the other characters to watch episodes of the show and see her youthful performances, which is the same backstory as Dan Schneider in the real world. This one really got people upset, and there was this overwhelming feeling of, oh, don't take Helen from me. I found this phenomenon fascinating, and it's one of the main things that inspired me to really study how people interact with these shows and the kind of discourse that you can see online. And this is why I created the running joke of Dan Schneider not existing. I was trying to make commentary on the way so many people insist upon not crediting him for his work when it's something they're sentimental about, when it's something like Spencer ah, yeah. or Helen or Sako or anything else. When you look at those characters, people want to believe that they exist in a vacuum and they have no origin. Now, the sad reality is that uh, some of these videos eventually became so popular that a lot of people online think that I single-handedly invented all discourse about these shows, and thus they assume that my own self-censorship didn't have a point at all, ever. Which is really fun. It's really fun when you spend eight months working on a video that has like a very direct point, and then thousands of people who didn't watch the video accuse you of not having a point. And yeah, no, I've definitely seen the discourse on Quentin on Twitter where people um, do just jump to conclusions about him and you know that they definitely did not watch the video because a lot of them would just be like, bro, this is like eight hours long. I ain't watching that shit. And then they would complain about him and stuff. But it's like, if, if you watch the video, you would understand <laughs> his point, right? And then people in your audience defend you by saying, well, yeah, he doesn't have a point, but his videos are funny and I fall asleep to them. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm so happy that's your defense of me. It's okay, Quentin. I watch your videos. We're mutuals on Twitter. I love you, bro. So to hammer home what my point was, I was never saying that it is good to just pretend that Dan Schneider doesn't exist. I was trying to hammer home the ridiculousness of this mentality and how not only is it fruitless to try and watch shows like iCarly without thinking about the series creator, the further you get down the timeline of these shows, the more his presence is felt, even if you don't say his name. And the big thing that I always thought was the most fascinating thing is that so many people want to maintain their relationships with these shows. Yes, they want to culturally indict Dan Schneider, but once they're done with that, they want to go right back to making memes about Butter Socks and Rex the Puppet. Because when you give Dan Schneider credit for something you don't like, you dismiss the issue. Mm -hmm. You go, oh, phew, well, that's Dan Schneider for you. Huh. But when you give Dan Schneider credit for something you enjoy, you revoke your ability to like that thing. You revoke your ability to like Spencer or Helen or anyone else from these shows. Yeah. And I guess the big conversation we have to have is, is this wrong? And the thing is, I went into this series with a pre-decided answer to that question. Oh. I opened up a Google Doc uh, during one of my first writing sessions, and it was, you know, a draft of the script for this video. 
And there was a long segment in that script that was all about this idea that it is wrong to try and enjoy these shows after we find out stuff like this. It is wrong to enjoy iCarly after we know about Dan Schneider. It's wrong to enjoy Ren and Stimpy after we know about John Kay. Oh, what next? Are we going to reboot Lil Bill? How about that, Nickelodeon? Are we going to get a new season of Lil Bill? Yeah, no, I think that that take, um, I'm assuming that he's going to go ahead and like revoke his uh, previous take there. But like, I, I don't think that's like the right way to go about it. Like, I think you can enjoy something and not enjoy its creator, right? Like, I feel like you can still ha hold sentimental value to a show that made you feel good in your youth or early days, whatever the case, despite knowing that that creator uh, behind it could have been awful, right? But as time passed, two big things happened. First of all, I think I became a little bit less pretentious. And second of all, you know, like I've said, I got sucked into the gravitational pull of this collapsing star. And I don't know what the hell the right answer is anymore. I mean, there were times working on this miniseries where I got especially depressed and I would sometimes go on walks and I would fantasize about how fun it would be to work on a victorious movie or to pitch an episode of the iCarly reboot. And it is true that the main recurring theme of this miniseries was supposed to be cognitive dissonance and kind of the weirdness of how we look at pop culture, but that doesn't mean that I didn't have fun, you know, playing the victorious games or filming all those crazy pinboard segments. So truthfully, I don't think I can tell you in good faith that you are never allowed to enjoy any of these shows ever again. But I guess the point I still want to make in this segment is, isn't it weird? Isn't it strange? Isn't it odd to only drag this guy out when there's something you don't like about his work? And to act like the characters that Dan created deserve protection more than the kids who played them. Part six, why yeah. do we need an iCarly reboot? Yeah. So this has been kind of the second underlining running thing in this miniseries, and I think it's best to, um, to tackle it here because it's very relevant. When I first started working on this series, Dan Schneider had been fired from Nickelodeon just two years before. And I had started to feel this was having a massive effect on the ongoing legacy of all of these shows. And so I wanted to make a series of videos kind of deconstructing that and eventually ending up here. But then, right after I started working on all this, they announced an iCarly reboot. Which, by the way, I've seen a few episodes of the iCarly reboot. I, you know, it definitely is not the greatest thing. I think that it is, it is a fine show for the most part and it tries to be like more adult like in nature until before the, the characters are adults um i think it was one of the shows that was on paramount or not earlier today but i found out was canceled earlier today um when the spill in the milk boys needed to watch it a uh, fun fact for anyone watching this i live with core from spill in the milk anyway um yeah like I, I i think that it's just fine you know uh it's kind of like how you can still enjoy the harry potter series but hate dislike the author of the books true that is absolutely true she who must not be named and I thought to myself, why? Why? To me, I always thought that Dan getting fired was a very thorough thematic end to his work, to his material. So now this new thing existing was a massive wrench in the works in terms of illustrating that thesis statement. But I was alone in this because everybody got excited and it seemed like everybody wanted more iCarly. And that was one of the big things that made me realize that I was not on the same page about this topic as everybody else. And I have constantly asked myself this question. Why was the specific moment where I decided to make a series of videos analyzing the downfall of Dan Schneider, the exact same moment where they rebooted his most popular work. And it was only in the last six like months spiritual calling. that I finally came up with an answer that I think makes sense, at least to me. And that is that to some extent, I am wrong to say that 100% of the legacy of these shows should go to Dan Schneider. 
because that is very dismissive of some of the younger people who yeah. have had to live yeah. with the reality of these brands being their life story. For instance, if you're going to credit one person with the legacy of Good Burger, it probably should be Cal Mitchell. Because sure, he didn't write the original sketch, he didn't write the movie, he didn't work on any of these adaptations. But he delivered the line that everybody loved, I think, right? Like, like you hear that and you're like, damn, this is good. But, you know, it's Cal Mitchell. He's the reason that the material works. And that's a reality that he has to live with when he goes out on the street and random people start talking to him. So I think that he has every right in the world to reclaim that character and keep using him. And to some extent, I think the kids from iCarly are the kids from iCarly. And there's nothing they can really do to change that, at least for most of them. I think for them, the iCarly reboot was probably a chance to say, this is what our lives are going to be, whether we like that or not. This brand, this show, iCarly. But at least we should be given a chance to reclaim the brand, reclaim our lives, and make this something worth being known for. And I think when you look at it that way, not only does it make sense, but the same can probably be said for a lot of you. The hmm. reason that shows like iCarly and Victorious were so successful was because you were there. Well, you know, honestly, that is, what can I say, man? It was all me. I mean, <laughs> iCarly wouldn't exist if I didn't watch it. Like, come on. I mean, I get it. But no, I, 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 I think I do get that. I think that it is important that we remember that it wasn't just Dan that worked on these shows. There were teams of people that made these shows as, as good as they were, right? Like, sure, he might have, like, help incept and create them but you know the actors played just as big of a part like the writers the other writers and stuff like that you know everybody on set that kept all the wheels moving like they they are just as important in the creation of the show <clears throat> as dan was right and and sure maybe you might not like the iCarly reboot as as much as you might want but yeah a lot of people were glad to have it back i was one of them and then, you know i watched it and i was like okay it's fine but i think his point is proven here that at the end of the day, like when I really think back on it, even though I absolutely hated everything that I had learned about Victorious in particular, when I think on it, would I want a Victorious like reboot or revival, whatever, spinoff future episode thing? Yeah. Like if you gave me like a Victorious movie or something telling me, showing me what the cast of Victorious was up to or maybe like a mini series, like I would watch it. I would be 100% invested at this point. This is a lot. You are the sole reason that those shows made it in the first place. And I think at the end of the day, the way that you consume media is kind of your own business. But all I hope is that in the future, when you're thinking about some of these shows, you sometimes just really quickly think to yourself, was it worth it? Was the, the hurt that so many of these kids went through, was it worth it so that you could be entertained? And I think just at That hurts. That hurts to think about, dude. Like, geez. Like, oh God, especially thinking back to the Drake Bell situation, right? Like, it's like knowing what he went through now and, and trying to look back at those episodes. It's like, you know, in the back of his head, it was bothering him at every waking moment. And he played it off just to entertain us, just to make us feel better, right? That's sucks just sucks asking yourself that question will do a lot in establishing where we need to go from here the silence is deafening part seven dan schneider the fall guy what? so this is probably going to be the part of the video that people misconstrue the easiest so i apologize if i have to kind of over explain what i'm going for here when okay I hold on my theory here is is he gonna say that dan schneider took the fall for all the abhorrent things that nickelodeon allowed to happen when dan schneider was helming all these shows because i would assume that the 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 ceo of nickelodeon is still the same one right from way back then or, or maybe just the one that like when when dan was working with him or whatever and he didn't get any flack, but dan did even though this happened under his ruling right I say the phrase Dan Schneider, the fall guy, 
A lot of you are probably anticipating that my thesis statement is going to be that when Dan Schneider was fired from Nickelodeon, it meant that other people who were complicit in a lot of these problems got away scot-free. Okay, that was That's what I was a very interesting topic. And for legal reasons, I'm going to speculate on it no further. The bigger topic that oh, I want okay. to talk about All right. <laughs> is the... That, that is not where I thought that was going then. <laughs> phenomenon of Dan Schneider as a cultural fall guy. And mm. to explain this, I am now going to repeat a quote that I have seen online verbatim so many times that it's not even funny. And this is the quote. Dan Schneider is single-handedly responsible for everything that went wrong in Amanda Bynes' life. I have heard people say that. I, I have heard people say that. That I don't think that's fair. Like, I genuinely don't think that's fair to him because it's, it's just like, if you really think on it, how, how do you even remotely begin to think that that's true? Like Amanda Bynes, you know, had her fair share of issues and was her own person. And he might have been involved in her life to some capacity, but it's not his fault. Is he though? Or is it just an easier conversation if we blame one semi-retired guy for everything instead of talking about the cultural system that consistently trades in the mental health of children yep. for millions of dollars? Yep. The thing that always bothers me when we talk about former child stars with traumatic backstories is that we always talk about them like they're dead, like they're not going around giving interviews and hosting podcasts, and it like strips them of their autonomy in a way that I find just really irritating. But the reason it bothers me so much when people have these reductive 280 character takes is not because I want to defend Dan Schneider. It's because when you blame one guy or one network, you ignore a much bigger problem that is still an ongoing issue. This is true. I'll give you another example. So the show Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, there's a podcast now hosted by the original stars of that show. Oh my God, I love the podcast, by the way. It's so fun. They are such great, like, they have such great chemistry together. It's, it's amazing. And Lindsay Shaw has often talked about stories on that podcast, which are kind of just things that she did and happened to her in Hollywood that are kind of suspicious and really weird. And I often see these clips go viral, and then I see people respond, Ugh, that's Dan Schneider for you. No, no. But he didn't even no. work on yeah, that that's, show. That, it's not even him, yeah. So why is your brain hardwired to bring him up every time something like this happens. Well, the thing is, the reality of the situation is that a lot of people just don't know how the industry works in general. And they assume that when you hear about these shows, like it's like the same sentiment of people who don't know the difference between Disney uh, uh, and Pixar movies, sorry, and like DreamWorks movies. There are people who actively think that they're the same thing, right? Like when, when you talk to some people and you mention the movie Shrek, they'll tell you that Disney made it. And when you talk to some people and you tell them the movie Wreck-It Ralph, they'll tell you that uh, DreamWorks made it. There are people out there who actively just don't know the difference. They don't care to know the difference. And it just doesn't matter to them. They just consume the media and that's all that matters at the end of the day. So for these people, when they hear about, um, you know, stuff like Ned's Declassified Survival and they hear about the issues that the actors had in that show or whatever, they'll be like, oh, Dan Schneider did that. Or they're, they're probably people who probably heard stuff about Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And they probably think Dan Schneider worked on that. But it's, it's just not true. It's just not the case and and they will never know they will never care to understand it is just how they perceive and see things right the answer is that people enjoy giving 100 percent of the blame for everything yeah, to dan schneider and hold truth, because yeah. then they can think well nickelodeon fired him he doesn't work in television anymore so now there are no problems with child stars in Hollywood. That's not true. Because it was all one fucking guy. Then that is just, that's just not true. These issues are still happening. They they just they, they didn't stop happening. It is still going on to this day, and it and it sucks. It really sucks. And you know we we don't know the full picture. It could it could quite literally be worse. And in 25 years from now, we're going to hear about another person who could have been worse or maybe is worse than Dan Schneider. And, and that sucks to know. Just think, if we can find some way to blame Dan Schneider on Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears, there's so many complicated things that we won't have to think about anymore.
because this is the big thing that sticks out to me about this topic. If Brian Robbins had never pulled Dan over to work on all that, and Dan had just remained an obscure former sitcom star, Nickelodeon would have found another producer to make 40 some odd episodes of live action kids content a year. They would have found another producer to push the limits of labor laws to get more and more stuff done. They would have found another producer to sexualize female teenage stars in the 2010s to boost their ratings. And here's the big question. If Jeanette McCurdy had been cast on a Disney Channel show, would she have had a happy childhood? What about Amanda Bynes? If you swap out Dan Schneider with any big name Disney Channel producer, is everything in her life suddenly fine? At the very least, when Brian Peck was outed, arrested, and sentenced for sexual abuse with a minor, Nickelodeon didn't just rehire him. Unlike the fucking Disney Channel over yep. here. Yep. And if you think that yep. every single... And that's just a, a fair point. Like, you can't just switch the industry or switch the network. Like, obviously, like, they're they're all just... they're Maybe not all, but, like, they're, you know, it's very blatant and obvious that Disney, right? Like, you might sit here and think that Disney is better. But, again, just looking back, Disney hired the pedophile. Disney knew he was a pedophile. Nickelodeon didn't know this about that man. And when they found out, they got rid of him. Disney did know this about that man and willingly let him in to work with more children. Single thing that happened in this video only happened because of Dan Schneider. Congratulations on the very sound sleep you are going to have tonight. Because Dan Schneider is gone and now there is no work left to be done. But the reality that I live in is that this conversation does not start or end with Dan Schneider. There is a culpability much more broad than that. And if we go out from here and we say that this is all in the past, then the industry will simply turn around and create a new Dan Schneider. Yep. It's probably and already personally, done that. And it sucks. I don't want to be standing here in 38 years having this exact same conversation. No, that's a that is a solid point. Like, honestly, if, if there's anything to take away from this video, that is that is a solid point, dude. It sucks. It really does suck. But at, at, at the at the very moment that we are living, that we are watching this video right now at its inception, there is probably someone who is probably already on their way to being worse. And I hate that. I really do. It takes a little dignity that Disney uh, is no saint, nor is any mega brand. No, absolutely. Oh, but he's rewinding. Oh. Looks like analog horror. That is good editing and a crazy line. On May the 12th, 2020, it was officially announced that Head of the Class would return for a modern reboot, huh? with Jeff Ingold and Bill Lawrence serving as executive producers and former Zack and Cody star Phil Lewis directing most of the material. All 10 episodes of the series would premiere on HBO Max on November the 4th, 2021. The series what? features a similar premise to the- well, I've never heard of this at all. Yeah, I was just saying, like chat's just saying too, they've never heard of this. I did not know this was a thing at all. Oh my goodness. The original. Isabella Gomez stars as Miss Alicia Gomez, a new teacher at Meadows Creek High School who begins instructing the honors debate class. Just like the original series, Head of the Class 2021 stakes much of its material on highbrow humor, derived from history, politics, and philosophy. Oh, you look like Pickle Rick. 
Only one oh, actor no. from the original series returned for the production. As in episode two, it is revealed that Terrell's mother is Darlene, a classmate of the original series oh. played by Robin Givens in both incarnations. That's Although in the reboot, she only has the most fleeting of cameos. 43 days after premiering, with almost no publicity of any kind... See, that makes more sense now, that there was no publicity whatsoever. I didn't know about this. I didn't even hear about this. Promoting the series, HBO announced that it would not be moving forwards with a second season. Wow, they also canceled One it. year after that, the series was deleted from HBO Max. Oh, wait, what? On occasion, the odd episode of the show might what? broadcast on. Wait, so it's like lost media now. They del what happened? Why did they delete the show? This that's so weird. Why did they delete the show? On Tubi or the Roku channel. But without some level of extreme forward thinking, there is no longer a legal way to watch Head of the Class 2021. While the original series was given years to build momentum and become a cult classic that would launch the careers of countless people, this one was just the reboot would only be allowed to exist for 13 months before being written off. Perhaps literally. With this, we enter a new age of television, where entertainment companies are run like Silicon Valley startups operating at a loss for decades while media is meant to have value for the second screen before the first, where growth matters more than performance and reboots are greenlit based on name recognition alone and then are shuttered away without pause for the effect that this has on the consumer. So, what? are you ready for the future? Because I'll tell you one thing, I'm not. That is so dystopian in nature. I can't even find my mouse. Where's my mouse? Where's the mouse? Oh, I can see it now. That is, that was. Wow. And then he goes on and credits everyone. Yeah, no, Quentin definitely made a masterpiece series. Again, his link is gonna be in the description down below. Uh, please subscribe to his channel. He has been doing this for quite literally years, right? Quite literally years. He, he, he's been like talking about like what has been going on with Dan Schneider and like, you know, everything happening, um, you know, with the series uh, that he, is, he has created. And I think the conclusions that we have come up uh, with here at the end of it all is that like, you know, it, it definitely is weird, uh, a lot of what happened, but you know, ultimately like a lot of us still like these shows and, and that's okay. I personally may never understand why people like victorious because i think for me that was the one show that i just absolutely will always hate um but at the end of the day i i definitely do still want more victorious if if that makes sense uh and and yeah ultimately like it it, it is what it is like I, I i hate to end things off on that and i and i told myself that i wouldn't really settle for the answer if it is what it is this year but ultimately that that it is just what it is like life continues to move on there like is is very little that we can do about stuff like this and it, it, it will continue to happen and unfortunately i don't think that this is the end of but this is probably the end of dan's story but like quentin said in this video that we will probably have someone else like dan and it sucks it sucks to think about but it's probably gonna happen right um in the same vein of like where a lot of people expect minecraft youtubers to be the most horrible people uh and it turns out that some of them are, are um it's probably just going to happen again. Uh, anyway, the, that's been my reaction on all of this. Hopefully you guys value my opinions and everything that I said uh, and giving context to other things that Quentin might have not mentioned in all of this. Uh, thank you for watching the video. And um, yeah, if you guys ever want to join us on stream, uh, link for that is also in the description down below. This is a very long video. And uh, if you got to the end, uh, comment the word pineapple. So I know that you got here. I appreciate you watching this video. Again, please check out Quentin's video, the original video. Hit the like on that one and all that good stuff. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one um bye bye i also have a very special cool thing happening soon so bye